Okay, we're back from break. First item. On June 23rd, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Mead to participate remotely in the June 23rd, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's temporarily medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Mead's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three, I move to allow Councillor Mead to remotely participate in the June 23rd, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's temporary medical condition. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Is there a second? Okay, the motion fails. Mr. Blair. Uh, I would ask that the council call a brief recess. All right, we will take um, a 10 minute recess. Okay, we're back from break. That was a break in uh, dog years, or turtle years. <laughs> Rough crowd out there. All right. On June 23rd, 2022, I received a request from Councillor Mead to participate remotely in the June 23rd, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's temporary medical condition that prevents her physical attendance at the meeting. I will now entertain a motion to allow Councillor Mead's remote participation in this meeting pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Pursuant to Stanton City Council procedural memorandum number three, I move to allow Councillor Mead to remotely participate in the June 23rd, 2022 Stanton City Council meeting due to a family member's temporary medical condition. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second that, this is Terry Holmes. All right, there's a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Ms. Dole. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. At this time, I'll ask Councillor Mead to state the remote location from which she is participating. I'm at 342 Sherwood Avenue, Stanton. Thank you. Could everyone um, on council as well as the audience hear Councillor Mead? Yes. yes. All, right. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, the next item is a consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Tonight I move to amend the regular meeting agenda to move item E to item C and to add item G, a resolution to rename the Stanton Equity and Diversity Commission. Also, I move to further amend the work session agenda and to move item five, a closed meeting for the interim city manager evaluation to the very end of the regular meeting agenda. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a second by Councillor Claffey. Any further discussion? Yeah, could I get the uh, list of the, what's now the regular meeting agenda? Okay, so. Uh, item A will be the public hearing and consideration of the stadium license agreement between the city and Mary Baldwin. B will be a public hearing and consideration of ordinance to grant an easement for the fiber optic 
telecommunications and C will now be the discussion and consideration of the Stanton Crossing Marketing Plan Strategy. D will be an update on the Centralized Recycling Center Pilot Program. E will be a presentation by Valley Community Service Board. F will be the consideration of the revised Shenandoah Valley Animal Services. G will be the discussion and consideration of the renaming of the Equity and Diversity Commission. And then um, at the very end of the regular meeting, after matters from the public, we will have a closed meeting. So item number five on the work session agenda has sure now can. been deleted. Delete it from the work session agenda, but move to the end of the regular meeting. Were there any... So F, yeah, so F is what now? Um, F is still the same. That's the um, Shenandoah Valley Animal Services. Okay. Well, you, and then G will be the uh, discussion and consideration of the renaming of the Equity and Diversity Commission. And then after that, we'll have matters from the interim city manager, matters from the public, and then we'll have um, the closed meeting for the interim city manager evaluation. Any further questions? Mr. Blair, does it sound good? Right, this, this would be the motion to amend. Correct. All right, um, with no other discussion, Mr. Kessaker, please call the roll. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Ms. Dull? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. I'll now this entertain. Is, this, I'd like to make another motion related to the agenda. Uh, okay. Kind of me. I'd like to, uh, I move to um, eliminate item three from the work session agenda. Okay, so there's a motion to eliminate item three, which is a discussion of a council procedure to respond to citizen requests for information during matters from the public. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, Vice Mayor Robertson has second. Any further discussion? Okay, that means um, there will no longer be item well, three. That's there the, needs to be a, a vote. I, I know, I'm, I'm just explaining. Um, so that means item three has will be eliminated if the vote passes, it'll be eliminated from the work session agenda uh, in its entirety. Uh, why would we wanna do that? Is there a piece? Mrs. Brenda Mead, the item was put on the agenda at my request. I've had conversations with uh, with Ms. Beauregard, I'm satisfied with the result of those com those conversations. If someone has an, an, another reason to have this on the agenda, then you know this would be the time to say so. Okay. okay. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. Kessler, please call the roll. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, now at this time, I'll entertain a motion for the consideration of the work session and regular meeting agendas as amended. M Madam Mayor, I move that we uh, approve the uh, work session and regular meeting agendas as amended. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second, Ms. Terry Holmes. Right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessaker, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. That takes us on to item number two, a discussion of a council procedure to notice public meetings of boards and commissions where three or more council members plan to attend. Ms. Beauregard. Uh, this item was added at the request of Council Member Mead, so I'd invite her to uh, start this item off for us. Councillor Mead. Thank you. I've requested uh, that we uh, change our procedure when announcing meetings uh, that, public, that, that are required for public notice so that um, we make, a, make it the consistent practice that those meetings be noticed 
uh, with the addition that uh, multiple members of council may attend, that more than two members of council may attend. Uh, and this is to avoid the embarrassing situations where a third member of council shows up and is asked to leave the meeting. And I think it does, it discourages members of council from attending public meetings. I think that's part of our job. So I would like to see our, our, our process changed so that when we are making notice of public meetings, we add that uh, to the notice so that we don't, uh, so that we avoid um, uh, FOIA violations and, and, and allow that flexibility. Great. Any questions for Councillor Mead? All right. Madam Mayor, I, I have just a question. I, I think it's right because I've been turned away and I know I've been at meetings where the third council member has been turned away. And I think it's a good thing that we're doing this. Um, the only thing I'm, I'm concerned about is I, I don't want council members to come to boards and commissions and get too actively involved in the discussions of the matters at hand. We, we have these boards and commissions to advise us and we like to have allow them the opportunity to hash it out amongst themselves and come to council with recommendations. And I'm afraid that if we get the, we get too many council members in a in a meeting, we might be asked for our opinion or our thoughts on this matter. And I, I say if we go as council members, we should go as observers only. And that um, if they have any questions of council, they should direct it through the council liaison. Is that possible? Mr. Blair. Good evening, Mayor Oaks, Council, Councillor Mead. Um, Councillor Claffey, to answer your question, that's where this is vexing, not just for the Stanton City Council, but for every public elected body I've ever served with. Um, and, and here's the issue. It's, you all can easily agree, and, and let's be clear, the FOIA quote unquote violation would be if three or more of you are at a meeting and you discuss the transaction of public business. Well, what is the transaction of public business? It's a matter that might come before you. And so I'm not going to, um, you know, rather than be esoteric, I'll just make it concrete. <clears throat> the Stanton City School Board has a, a meeting and it's about their budget request to you all and three of you show up. If three of you sat in the audience and you didn't discuss among yourselves anything about the budget and you observed and then you left, that FOIA is not, not no. Im implicated because it's not a meeting. You didn't discuss or transact public business. The problem, and again, this is not specific to the Stanton City Council, but again, every body that I've served is you, three or more of you show up at a school board meeting when they're discussing the budget or the planning commission when they're discussing a land use application. And the chair or a member of the body says, well, I see you know, the mayor or I see council member Dole or council member Claffey and what do they think? And then you're put in the spot of, if I say something, then I may commit a FOIA violation if the meeting wasn't noticed. Or I can just, you can kindly come up and say, I'm sorry, but if I speak on that matter, I would be violating the Freedom of Information Act as this meeting wasn't noticed. But I think, and I don't want to speak for Councillor Mead, I think what, what her proposal is designed to do is if that situation occurs, you all, the meeting would be noticed. And if, if for instance, the Planning Commission, the chair says, Mayor Oaks, what, and you know, it's not usually, they don't ask, what do you think about this? It's more Mayor Oaks, um, 
Can you tell us what factors the council's looking at uh, or what the council is looking at in relation to the um, zoning ordinance? Um, and again, that, that, that probably hops over the line into being a meeting for FOIA purposes. So, I, and, and again, I will gladly miss me if you want to add or, or think have something different to say, but I think that's the, the gist of the proposal is to, if you get that call from a chair or a member of a body that says, what do you all think about this or that, you would have the ability to respond without violating FOIA. Mr. Blair, may, um, is it not true, at least uh, since uh, Leslie, and you've been around that you are actually noticing, putting it out there that there may be more than, you know, uh, two council members present at meetings, basically taking the, you know, the, the fire out of this. I mean, if you're, if you're noticing it, then it really doesn't, am I, am I incorrect? Or no, I, I think really Mr. Kessiker might, I, I think there are instances we have i mean especially if we have a, a no that that could be the case um i don't think it's been a practice really in the past um so as we learned that this could occur or that you know there could be a possibility that three of you might show up we did we have noticed meetings um to make sure that you know you don't that the situation mr blair talked about doesn't occur and you don't it's not an uncomfortable situation when you go to the meeting and they want to interact with you for some reason right so we've we've been doing it, but it's been fairly recent and really really with situations where we know that's going to happen or we can try to predict that. But I actually asked Mr. Kesker to pull the calendar the other day and to kind of see what meetings were coming up. And so I knew, knowing that we were going to talk about this this evening, um, so that's kind of where we are right now to see where this conversation went. But um, so we've been talking about it. It's certainly been a topic of conversation in the office fairly recently. So. I mean. I mean, I reckon my my guts. I'm just a little hesitant at this point to try to redo the things again. I mean, we have, you know, I, I mean, I, that's just my 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 initial take on it. Is that we're changing those procedural memorandums yet again? And um, wouldn't this be more just an operating procedure that Mr. Kessiker would just? Put in, yes. put in a sentence. And that's what I right, exactly. On all the notices, and and is, we're done. So we're already doing it for some. Yeah, and so, this, so yeah. you're saying just do it for all of them, so that we're all covered. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I, and that's fine. I, I think the only, um, the only real issue, and and again, I'll, I'll let Mr. Kesker if he wants to come in is is we can anticipate as a staff what events may draw more than two of you, you know, a school board meeting, a planning commission meeting that has a topic. Um, but there may be, you know, what we want to avoid is if there's some community event, and again, uh, three of you show up and, and then somebody is asked to say something, um, about the budget or something of that nature. Do you, can you think of any instances? So I'll give an example for sure. that. So the marker ceremonies recently that we had, we did notice those saying right. that that wasn't a meeting, but that three or more council members may appear, may show up and this is at that event. So we also try to anticipate those types of events just to cover because you never know, you're going to be right. asked to say something or do something related to that or related to some business with that event. So um, we typically do do that as well. So, so. I, I just want to clarify uh, what you said, Mr. Blair. If three members of council appear at a meeting and do not discuss public business, then uh, there is no FOIA violation. The mayor, the mayor fact that three people showed up at a meeting does not constitute a FOIA violation. Correct. Right. And so, you know, I, I would say you can't legislate common sense. So if three members of council happen to show up 
and decided that they were going to engage in what would cause uh, a FOIA violation, I, I, I just, you know, I, I just say, you know, we need to assume each of us has enough common sense not to engage in, in a in behavior that would result in a FOIA violation. You, you can't legislate, you know, you can't make laws for everything. Uh, yep. Agree. The only, the only thing that I might add that we might as a staff work on is maybe during budget season, um, if we know the school board's going to be talking about the request that they're going to make to council, it does seem like that that sometimes that draws three. So maybe we should, if we know the school board's having a, wet, a work session or a meeting about the budget, maybe notice it, that three city councilors may be there in attendance. Why would we just not have a practice of doing that? So that it takes the mystery out of it. Staff doesn't have to think about, well, there might be, I mean, this looks interesting. Three people might show up. Personally, I just want the flexibility to show up at a meeting, because I think that's my job as a member of city council, to hear what people are saying, you know, and, and I, I just want the ability to do so without having to go through this rigmarole of, of, um, of uh, you know, uh, either being asked to leave the meeting when I have no intention of having a conversation about what's going on at the meeting with other members of council or responding to questions from, from people in, in, in the meeting. I mean, I'm there as an observer and I know how to tell people I'm here as an observer. <laughs> Nobody, you know, I don't, I, you don't need to make a rule for me. I, I figured that out. Mr. Blair, I, I have a question. If three people, if three council members show up at a meeting and two of them are just there to hear what people are saying, but the third person starts providing input does it make all three guilty of a FOIA violation? If so, I want I want everything noticed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it technically it does, but again, FOIA in terms of the individual liability, there has to be an intentionality um, in terms of the fines. But what I think I'm hearing that might be best is we could just have have a a set of notices that I, I think it'd probably be school board and planning commission meetings just to put out that three or more members may show up. And that would cover you for FOIA purposes. So you never know what might be on either body's agenda that would attract three or more council members wanting to attend. So we can just say, you know, for school board and planning commission meetings, what about the uh, Why don't we diversity do equity? Yeah, and, and because we've we already got two. You know so, what? Economic well, Development Authority. I yeah, think EDA. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Why not just do it on all on all of them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it's and, the and, standard and, standard language. A sentence added to our public and, meeting notice. That's that's all I. And we know that we know that other than the liaison that we don't participate in the meeting. That 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 just makes sense to me. You know, that old saying, kids need to be seen, not heard. Okay. <laughs> well, I think what we could do then is just change our notices to indicate that three or more city council members may be in attendance. Yeah. I indicated, I already asked Mr. Kester to pull up a calendar so we could look at it to see, so we can, he can put on his calendar kind of reminders and notices. Um, Cause we don't put out, I don't believe Mr. Kester, you don't do like the planning commission notices, correct? Or do you? Uh, not unless we, yeah. we know. That yeah. So we can work through that. And I did notice the Equity Diversity Commission. Yep. I should probably notice that, for instance. So um, that's fine. I've already asked them to start rolling with that, because depending on what happened this evening. So, yeah. Councillor Holmes. I have one other question. So if somebody attends the meeting and then they talk to another council member, is, is that not kosher? Well, I think what I would... I, here's what I would say to that, right? I, and, and this, to play your hypothetical yourself, Ms. Dole and Mr. Robertson are at a planning commission meeting. And then after the meeting, you and Mr. Robertson talk about the zoning application. Um, as long as Ms. Dole's not part of that conversation. So as long as it's I think, one-on-one. Yeah, yes, one -on -one. but 
again, this this would be a nice prophylactic to get out of those those particular questions, so to speak, if we just start putting on our notice. Okay. All right, so you have your direction. All right, thank you. Okay, moving on to item four, roll call. We are now at the portion of the agenda called roll call. Roll call allows each council member an opportunity to bring forth matters for staff follow-up either during the same meeting or at a future work session or regular meeting if additional time is required to respond to a council member's inquiry. All right, I'm gonna start with Councillor Clappy. Uh, nothing tonight. Um, let's not hoping I'm not offending my my friend back here in, in blue, but the item that I ask both of you all about, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, um, about PD parking. Um, prior to the flood, tendily most of the police cars, I believe, and Chad, correct me if I'm wrong, used to be in that bottom layer. Ever since the flood, almost all of the police cars are on levels one and two. And so, it, yeah, please come up. I mean, I just was going to ask, I mean, because it may affect some people, citizens' ability to park. And I was just, you know. Mr. Robertson, we, we still utilize that bottom area. Okay. But due to the number of cars that we have now, which are take-home vehicles, there's not enough parking spaces on that bottom level. All right. Um, so we do have to sometimes put them up on the, the upper level there as well. Okay. All right. And there's, there are like only it's... three um, reserved police parking spaces on Central Avenue, so we have to utilize the garage quite a bit. Okay. And having always, I always park, I park down there and it looks like after everything was repaired and we could park down there again, it looks like all the cars that were there before are back there. So okay. there's the same number down there and assume, presumably the same number that used to be up top. I mean, before they were all okay. up top. And then I just, I wasn't like aware that back down. we had that many take home cars now and everything. So yes, yeah, so you're ganging up on me now. It's another blue showed up, so, you know. <laughs> Councillor Mead. Uh, yes, I have a number. Number of citizens have asked for clarification on a statement that was made by a member of City Council uh, to Channel Three, I believe, um, saying that the state recommends carving out entrance corridor, and that and I'll, uh, the, the quote is recommends, but carving out entrance corridor ordinance for car dealers. And I'd hope that Mr. Blair could clarify that. Um, I can report back at the next meeting. Thank you. All right. Councillor Dole? I have nothing. All right. Councillor Holmes? I would like for the council to uh, set my apology for being late and would like for y'all to find me one of them things that I could put on my keys so mm -hmm. that I can find it. <laughs> on my phone, we can get you one of those Apple trackers. I tell you, it, I, I was so stressed out. And then when my new car key wouldn't start, I was really stressed out because I got. You made it. You made it. But anyway, but I'm really sorry. good to have you here, Jerry. <laughs> hey, um, Miss Beauregard, the July Fourth festivities um, being held by the Happy Birthday America, um, the City Council. Are we in the July Fourth parade? Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Kessaker submitted your parade application today again we're all new to this so we were trying to figure it out as well so the applications has been submitted i think mr tuttle was going to deliver the package i'll follow up tomorrow about the package because i think they're going to be ready on saturday with the packets for the parade right. but you are now registered for the parade correct right. yeah he took care of that so now, can i can we find out how many of cancel is going to Maybe be in the parade. I, I'm going to. I'm going I'm to be on vacation. I'm going to be on vacation. I'll be celebrating it in Ireland. There you go. On oh, Ireland. Oh wow. Brenda, are you going to be around or? She's I will be Atlanta. celebrating my 45th wedding anniversary in Saint Simon's Island, Georgia. Well, Congratulations. Congratulations, Carolyn. You going to be around? 
I don't know where I'm going to be, but it won't be in the parade. It won't be in the parade. Okay. I, I would think maybe Amy. Uh, yes, Amy will be back. Um, a Councillor Darby. And I'll be in it. Okay. I'm up. Okay. All right. So, All right. yeah, so four. We, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you can just um, let us know yeah, I have where and yeah. in the lineup and yeah. where I we're supposed to meet. I have to touch base with Mr. Tuttle tomorrow about that. So we'll make sure we get that information. Okay. All right. Okay, that takes us to a uh, break. We will meet back at 730 for the regular meeting. Like any, I'm really warm. I don't think yeah. <clears throat> As mayor of the city of Stanton, I call the regular Stanton City Council meeting to order on June 23rd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. And the first item is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right next is the invocation moment of silence. And tonight it's um, Councillor Clappy's turn. Well, Madam Mayor, as we approach 4th of July, I sought some appropriate comments from the author of the Declaration of Independence, our third president, and of course the founder of the University of Virginia. Then Thomas Jefferson gave these words on March 4th, 1801 at his first inauguration, and I find them amazingly appropriate 220 years later. So please join me, if you will, in a prayer by Thomas Jefferson. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable ministry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion us into a one united people, the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endow with thy spirit of wisdom those whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, that through obedience to thy law, we may show forth the praise among the nations of the earth. In time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail. All of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, the next item is the mayor's report. Um, let's see, I, um, I've been pretty busy. I had the opportunity to speak with some veterans of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. I attended the West End Business Association meeting, the SDDA meeting. Um, Ms. Beauregard was in attendance in the SDDA meeting as well. Uh, the Equity and Diversity Commission, Councillor Mead was also in attendance in that meeting. Um, Ms. Beauregard and myself attended a grant ceremony, a grant award ceremony with a Jones Gardens. That was very nice. I thoroughly enjoyed being out there and I cannot wait to get back out and do some gardening. Um, oh, let's see. I also attended the Community Foundation Awards Ceremony and Councillor Claffey was in attendance as well. So it's been a, a busy month. The next item is additional items by members of council. Are there any additional items by members of council? Councilor Dole. Uh, I attended the uh, Virginia Commonwealth Criminal Justice Services Board meeting and the committee on training, because I'm a member of both of those. Uh, it's always a joy to drive to Richmond and find parking downtown. <laughs> It reminds me why I live here. Um, I also attended the Central Senator Planning District Commission. And uh, I, 
I was uh, reelected to their executive committee again. <clears throat> and so that, that's enough for me. Fine. <laughs> okay. And um, I'd also like to mention that uh, Ms. Beauregard attended the Community Foundation Awards Ceremony as well. All right. Councilor Cleffey. Yeah, and let's see, I attended the library uh, advisory board meeting last Thursday evening. And this morning at 8.30 a.m., we had the EDA meeting. But I'm not going to go into that because we have some gentlemen here who are going to update us and, and share with what they shared with us this morning. Great. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? All right, moving on to the next item, the approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the special meeting of June 7th, 2022. Oh, yeah. Madam Mayor. Councillor Claffey. I move that we approve the minutes of the special meeting of June 7th, 2022. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Vice Mayor Robertson is second. Any further discussion? And hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item is the approval of minutes for the work session and regular meeting of June 9th, 2022. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Councilor Claffey. <laughs> I move that we accept the minutes on the work session and regular meeting of June 9th, 2022. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? And I'll second that as well. All right. Vice Mayor Robertson has second. Any further discussion? And hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Ms. Dull? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. That takes us to the regular meeting. Item A is a public hearing in consideration of stadium license agreement between the city and Mary Baldwin University. Ms. Beauregard. Uh, Mr. John Blair, city attorney, will handle this item this evening. Welcome, Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks, members of council. Before you tonight is a license agreement that would give Mary Baldwin University use of the uh, baseball facility. Um, <clears throat> And I want to point out a couple of things here. It's the baseball facility at Gypsy Hill Park. I should make that clear. The license would run from September 1st of this year through April 30th of next year. And I know that, you know, if, if you're like me, the first thing that comes to mind is a lot of city teams use that field. A lot of um, the high school the youth baseball teams use that field. Um, but if you take a look at section number uh, four, one, and well, I'm sorry, uh, section number <clears throat> six, one, and six, two, um, the city, again, reserves the right, and basically it, it states that the schools and youth league teams have the priority to use the field during these dates. Mary Baldwin will provide at least will provide the schedule for both its fall and spring seasons at least 90 days in advance so that we can work out so there aren't any conflicts between city functions or city schools or youth baseball activities and Mary Baldwin for use of this license. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions? Madam Mayor, yes. In I'm concerned about the conditions of the, uh, the field. I have toured the facility and it is not in the best of shape. It needs some new dugouts. Right field is sadly submerged. If you go stand in right field, you're looking up at the pitcher's mound and it, it has deteriorated over the years. And I've I've heard some complaints from some baseball people. We used to have one of the finest parks in the league. And um, we're going to need to do some work on this field. And I know it is not scheduled at this time, but I am concerned that you are tying this field up for 12 months out of a year. And in the event that Chris Tuttle and these uh, can get Parks and Rec some money to rework the field, 
we're going to have to have a timetable where we can rip it up, add some dirt, plant some seed, and we're not going to be able to play on it for one of these seasons. And I want this, you know, I didn't realize that we were going to commit to it in the fall. And I was hoping that when the brave season ended, there would be some fall time that we could get this thing in good shape for next spring. And I know that Mary Bowen uses it in the spring, as does our uh, Stanton high school team. And then, of course, the Braves will be back again next June. So I was hoping that when I saw the timetable on this, I realized this is going to cut this year out of it. And that's only going to make the field worse. So I'm willing to go along with this because we don't have any money to do this at this point. But I think that Mary Baldwin needs to realize that we're going to have to have a break if you're here if we're going to uh, renovate this field in next year. Well, understood. Um, certainly we can let Mr. Tuttle know that. I think what might be, um, <clears throat> you know, when you take a look at 6-1 in this, the city hereby reserves and accepts the use of facilities when in the sole discretion of the facilities that the city, the facilities are needed for civic purposes, scheduled community recreation events or other purposes. Um, I think we, I, I think the reality though, Councillor Claffey, I mean, we have that provision in there, but what you're talking about is and effectively not using the fields for the spring or the fall. Or the fall. And Probably. that's not contemplated by this license agreement. And I just would like that to be brought to Mary Bowen's attention that maybe next year we're going to have to, you yeah. know, let's okay. do it for this year, but let's be making plans. And hopefully we're going to get some assistance from Mary Bowen in the uh, yeah. renovation. Process. Well, and, and even there was some discussion last time about possibly even deepening, you know, because it, we Moxie has become one of the shortest stadiums in the league now. Right. And uh, and I know Mary Baldwin has spoken about that because they definitely, you know, some of these other teams come in here and just have a have a home run fun time. Yeah, because they, this is college ball being played on this field. So, right. I mean, they're, we need a deeper field. I would uh, suspect Mary Baldwin would appreciate any upgrades or renovations. So um, we can certainly have the conversation with Mary Baldwin. Perhaps they'd be willing to pay for it, too. Well, I, well, exactly. I think we need to get some help from them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mary and the Baldwin. Braves as well. And Yes, I agree. Yeah. I'll, I'll it it has Mr. to be a collabor collaboration. I'll work with Mr. Tuttle, and we'll, I'll talk to him. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, because I think both Braves and Mary Baldwin could probably ante up a little bit for that. Correct. Certainly. Would, would you have any confusion when you have rain dates or you get rained out? Again, uh, if you take a look at the license, there is a 24-hour provision um, when, practic when practicable that the city's to give Mary Baldwin if it needs it. And I think that would be, in fact, um, concerning rain days. Um, again, I, <clears throat> I would imagine that there could be a cooperative relationship that, that you would hope you could work a rain date right. where neither – Neither team ends up having to cancel a game because of double booking, but um, certainly that provision is in there that the city has priority for its events and has to give at least 24 hours notice when practical. And we've done this for several years and it's, right. it's worked out. Correct. So, and, and I believe this is the only fall ball that's being played there. You know, the Braves won't be there and there's no Stanton High School playing there. Right. All right. Any additional comments or questions? All right. Ms. Beauregard, you said you would have a conversation with Mr. Tuttle. Yes, I took notes and wrote down what you all said, and I'll, I'll work with him, and we'll, we'll follow back up on that. All right. Thank you. All right. So this um, is a public hearing. Let me read the statement that Mr. Blair has printed up for me. In a moment, I will open up the public hearing. It is a time that council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a specific topic. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. 
When you reach the five minute time limit, I will let you know that your time limit has expired. For our Zoom participants, please raise your hand now if you wish to speak on this particular public hearing. If you raise your hand during the public hearing, you will also be able to raise your hand during the council meeting for other public hearings and matters of the public, and please keep your comments to five minutes as well. Once everyone who wishes to speak has had an opportunity, I will then close the public hearing. I will now open the public hearing, so if you wish to speak, please approach the podium, and we'll alternate between the individuals physically present and those that have their hands raised via the Zoom platform. So again, um, when I bang the gavel, that will open up the public hearing, and we'll start with um, the citizens in the audience, and then from there, we'll move on to the participants on Zoom and just go back and forth. Uh, once everyone's had a chance to speak, I will uh, close the public hearing out by hitting the gavel. Please state your name, your address, and you have five minutes to speak. With that, the public hearing is now officially open. If anyone from the audience would care to address the council. This is about baseball, right? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> I used to be involved, heavily involved in baseball many, many years ago. So many things, but it was one of them. And we always had a good team. Unfortunately, one was a little bit too old and we had to lose a number of games because of that. However, if you plan on giving Mary Ball an opportunity to play in that field, hopefully that Mary Ball will produce good teams. Without good teams, it's a waste of time. It's like the Stanton Braves this year. They've only won five games, five games, and lost 11. It's not very good record at all. And yet, I can understand. They don't hit the ball, and the pitchers need a lot of work. And also the manager. When a man is throwing balls and balls and balls and balls, it's time to remove them not embarrass him or embarrass the team. And not only that, if Mary Baldwin is going to use the ballpark, then Mary Baldwin should be responsible for paying for some of the improvements of that ballpark. It should not be for free. Nobody should be using that ballpark for free. Even the high school should be paying something towards fixing up that ballpark. It's a lovely ballpark probably one of the best in the whole country, not county, but country. No, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kessiker, does anyone have their hand raised? No, ma'am. All right. Would anyone from the audience care to speak? All right. With that, the public hearing is now closed. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that City Council authorize the license agreement between the city and Mary Baldwin University for the use of John Moxie Memorial Baseball Stadium, as noted in the license agreement, and further authorize and direct the city manager to sign the license agreement with such modifications and in final form as approved by the city attorney. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Eric, I second. This is Terry Holmes. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessler, please call the roll. Ms. Dole? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to item B, a public hearing in consideration of ordinance to grant an easement for fiber optic telecommunications infrastructure on city-owned property in Augusta County. Ms. Beauregard? Uh, Mr. Blair will also handle this item tonight. Welcome back, Mr. Blair. Thank you, Mayor Oaks and Council. Um, before you tonight, um, we have what's called a franchise ordinance, which is required by the Code of Virginia. And this was placed on the agenda um, because Shenandoah Valley Electric Co-op had requested an easement on city property. Um, subsequent to their request and advertisement, um, right now they have since withdrawn that request. Um, they may be coming back with a modified easement. Um, certainly, if they do, we would ask them to pick up the cost of the advertisement the second go-round. Um, but 
right now we've not received any bid from Shenandoah Valley Electric Co-op. However, the mayor needs to formally ask the audience if there are any other bids. All right, and with that, I am formally asking the audience, does anyone else have any bids? And hearing none, we can move on. Right. With no bids, there there would be no public hearing because the franchise would not be granted. And okay. Therefore, you'd move on to the next item. Well, thank you for that. All right, moving on to item C, which is now a discussion and consideration of the Stanton Crossing Marketing Plan Strategy. Ms. Beauregard. Sure. Uh, Amanda DeMeo from Economic Development is here, and I'll allow her also to introduce her guests that are here this evening. Welcome. And I believe they have a presentation as well. So. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. It's a pleasure to be here for you this evening. Last year, council approved funding for the preparation of the Stanton Crossing Marketing Plan Strategy. The procurement office awarded the project to the team of Timmins Group and Hunt and Andrews Kurth. A kickoff meeting with our stakeholder group took place in February to provide input discussing site objectives and priorities to be considered as part of the plan. This morning, Tim Davey and Lee Downey presented the draft marketing plan to the EDA where it received unanimous approval. As you were previously briefed, the 100,000 for implementing the plan could be allocated from the ARPA funds with a budget amendment at council's July 28th meeting. So this evening, Mr. Davey and Mr. Downey are here to present the plan and answer any questions you may have as we request your approval to continue moving Stanton Crossing forward. And I'll pull this up. Hand it over to Tim Davey for you. Welcome. Hey, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor Oaks, members of council. Um, my name is Tim Davey. I'm with Timmins Group. As Amanda mentioned, we're thrilled to have been selected to complete this next step of the Stanton Crossing Plan. Uh, we're very fortunate to have been part of this project from a, from a um, perspective, from a consulting perspective, for a number of years. Uh, most importantly, the business plan um, that was done and presented over the course of the last couple of years, which I'll give a quick highlight to. And then, as Amanda mentioned, you know, we started working on this marketing plan, which is really the next step uh, in the evolution of a successful economic development project. So we're thrilled for the opportunity uh, to remain one of your consultants on this important project. And we're very excited to talk about uh, what it is that we'd like to um, discuss with you this evening. Mr. Davey, this is Brenda Mead. I just have a quick question. Go back to that first picture. Is that a part of Stanton? Now, I don't recognize that. Uh, no, that's a um, just a generic opening slide. Okay, thank you. From Timmins Group, not part of Stanton. <laughs> Again, the Stanton Crossing uh, business plan took a number of different steps towards making sure that we could identify, um, you know, an overall sort of business plan for this park. I'm going to run through relatively quickly some of the highlights back from the business part of the plan that we did that led us to where we are tonight with the marketing plan. Uh, this is an overall of the property that many of you have probably seen from the plans in the past. Uh, and the main components of this park that we thought were special and unique to try to start focusing on marketing uh, was this campus in through here where a lot of the buildings are currently being demolished. And this business plan talked that this could be a wonderful opportunity for an advanced manufacturing campus um, because of the nature of the topography that's there, the nature of the infrastructure that's there once the buildings are gone. Uh, and it's a really important feature of this park that we thought is something that we could really focus on. Uh, the other thing that I identified during the business planning process was, was that this site had some unique attributes uh, based on the uh, power infrastructure and its location for data centers at the time. Uh, we've since sort of advanced that strategy to expand a little bit more into what we're calling the mission, mission critical um, sector, which includes not only data centers, but a lot of the vertical farming elements at Dominion Energy and some of the economic development initiatives around uh, the Commonwealth are starting to work towards. And we still think that's a sound strategy for us to try to focus and wrap 
a marketing plan around. And then like any good master plan for a piece of real estate, it recognizes that we're never going to predict exactly what the size and shape and locations of, of the buildings are going to be. So we want to make sure that there's an opportunity to flex um, and adjust with market and market conditions. And that's been more true now during the pandemic than ever before, as we've started to see uh, the number of prospects accelerate and want to be able to try to create more dense and vertical um, projects as opposed to the, the um, broad and um, single story facilities and advanced manufacturing and data centers and things like that. So for me, this is important slides for us to go through and always revisit and make sure that our business plan makes sense before we're gonna la launch into the marketing strategy that we're gonna talk about shortly. It's also important for us to recognize that the overall phase that we're in right now is not the first phase of Stanton Crossing. It really is the second phase where the first phase has already been tremendously successful along the entrance. And we wanna make sure that we don't forget about that uh, and make sure that we're gonna to try to see with an opportunity where we can expand that success into the park if appropriate. Uh, there's also the scenario that we might end up with a large prospect who wants everything uh, in the park that's remaining and we have to be able to accommodate that as well. I also think it's important that we go back to the metrics that were established in the business plan uh, and talk about the fact that our goal is not to just create a pretty picture and a master plan that sort of sits on the shelf, but we've got some metrics that sort of define why it is that we're actually asking for additional money to start going forward in marketing. And this is a table out of the business plan that we did a number of years ago where we actually talked about the potential for square footage as a building, capital investment, real estate taxes, machinery and tools. Uh, and I presented to the EDA this morning and very proud, you know, to sort of talk about a project that we're part of that was announced just last week, uh, where Lego announced it was going on a 340 acre piece of property in Chesterfield County. It has a 110 acre pad site. Uh, it creates about the same 1.8 million square feet on that 100 acre pad site. Uh, and the capital investment of that project is north of a billion dollars. So the types of projects that we could be in play for um, are not only aligned with this master plan that we talked about in the business plan, but it could even be more than that. And that was Lego? Yes, the Lego Group, which is the North American subsidiary of the Lego Corporation. This will be their first largest um, and uh, most sophisticated manufacturing facility in the world. And it's gonna be built here in Virginia. It was just announced last week. This recommendation uh, was the top 10 recommendations that we made out of the business plan. Uh, and again, many of the things in the business plan you had already started and we're very proud to have sort of reaffirmed that things like demolishing the existing buildings was extremely important. Making sure the spine road that you got funded through VDOT was extremely important using um, not only the funds that the state provided, but a lot of the Brownfields grants uh, that Amanda and her team you know, actually went out and got. Uh, we talked about an ROI analysis, which is really a business metrics tool that we still think is important for us to consider, um, and making sure that the site continues to approve through the site readiness tiering system that VEDP recognizes and, and actually helped us fund the design of the infrastructure that's ongoing right now. Uh, the city was uh, awarded an $850,000 grant to start building or designing infrastructure towards this tier four readiness. And I know Amanda and her staff are working with VDP right now to go ahead and apply for a construction grant to get the, the money to actually build that infrastructure. So all that is really reflected in item number five. And what we're here to talk about tonight uh, is the marketing plan. And we still think just as we did two years ago that it was an important thing for us to invest in. Uh, we think it's equally important for us to continue to invest in that now. So we were proud to have partnered with Hunt and Andrews Kurth, as Amanda mentioned, and Lee Downey is here, uh, who's a good friend and has been a colleague of mine for a number of years. And this was a great opportunity for he and I to collaborate together uh, on really where we think we ought to be taking the marketing plan. And so what I'm gonna do is turn the presentation over to Lee and then stay here, obviously by his side to answer questions that you guys have at the end. Lee? Hello, welcome. Thank you, thank you. As Tim said, I'm Lee Downey. I'm with the Hunt and Andrews Kurth Group. Um, we are a consulting group within larger law firm, international law firm. Um, the, the the practice was formed about four years ago to work on government relations and economic development. And it was founded by Todd Haymore, who was the Secretary of Commerce under Terry McAuliffe, but going back three governors working in economic development. Uh, just a little background on me 
so you know where I'm coming from and why I found this extremely exciting to work on this project. I spent over a decade at local and regional economic development groups uh, with the city of Richmond and again in the greater Petersburg region. And I spent nearly a decade with the Virginia Economic Development Partnership as a business development manager working with prospects. So I've been on the product development side, I've been on the prospect side, and now I'm doing site selection for Hunt and Andrews Kerr. It's about half of our half of our work is working with companies that are trying to relocate or expand. So I um, I work in the field of the people that we need to reach out to for this marketing plan. So doing this has been kind of pulling all that history together to come up with the plan. Uh, as Amanda said earlier, we started off by pulling together a group of stakeholders because we wanted to hear from people here what they thought, what they saw, what their their uh, visions were and, and build off that foundation. So we pulled together the stakeholder group that involved a variety of people such as the EDA, city staff, um, members of the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, both on this site preparedness side as well as the business development side, uh, Shenandoah Valley Partnership and private uh, development partners, as well as the Buckingham Branch Railroad. Sorry, wrong direction. And what we pulled to work on were the targeted industries from the business plan. Uh, we looked at manufacturing, logistics and transportation, food and beverage slash agricultural, professional services, which can range from customer support to back office to, um, to IT support. We looked at rail oriented industry because that option is available and is, uh, the word is unique, is overused, but a somewhat unique attribute for the site, as well as data centers and mission critical centers. So I am one of those guys that's deeply believes in analyzing to a, a point of uh, boring people. So I, in this, I'll give you a summary, but what we did is we did a deep analysis of, of where the site um, stands as far as attracting business and what, what the vision is and what the reality is to create an effective marketing strategy. And in that, we need to know what's being marketed and the analysis we needs to know what's the competition, what, who are we competing against? Because if we're gonna market, we gotta know who we're marketing head on with. What are the attributes that are unique or what makes it strong or stand out among its competitors? What are positive and neg negative attributes of the site, whether real or perceived? Who's the target audience? What type of economic development successes are historically being realized in the market area? Because if we're pursuing something yet, those results are not happening in the area. Are we chasing something that won't happen? Or if something's not happening, how can we make this be the site to pull that in? How effective are current efforts to get the site in front of prospects? How often is this site getting into the view of the people who are making decisions? And what are the most effective and desired methods of relaying information? Because you can, you know, just like in real estate, you can print flyers all day and hand them out, but let's do targeted. Let's make sure that we're doing it most effectively. So we started off with a, a review of competitor sites. When people are looking for sites in this region, what other sites are they looking at? Who are we competing against to get in front of them and, and to get into that final decision mode? This is a small map, but I just wanted to kind of show you the area we looked at as far as competitor sites. It's really kind of that 81 corridor. Um, and these are the sites, these sites were worked and chosen by the stakeholder group with a lot of input from BDP who does a lot of site selection and knows what sites are being submitted for projects, as well as you know the, the private site selectors such as myself that actually recommend sites. So we took these sites and put them into this chart to try to show you what we were looking at. These are the sites we identified and we looked at some more sites in size and preparedness and for projects that would likely be in similar submissions and went through, pulled all the data. And then this color coding is just to give you a quick glimpse. 
of the areas in yellow, those are areas where it's pretty comparable. These sites aren't that different in these attributes from Stanton Crossing. Those areas that are highlighted in green show an advantage, maybe slight, maybe a, a large advantage. Give you an example, we looked at distance from interstate and we took a five mile range. So a couple of these are more than five miles off the interstate. So there's the advantage in being closer to the interstate. The topography, some of these are rolling, sloping. Some of them are much, will take much more work to get them to the point of development than Stanton Crossing is currently at. So that's an advantage. The red shows those areas that may be considered a disadvantage. Some of those are, if you look at New River Valley Commerce Park, they have a much larger contiguous acreage. So a, a site that needs more land, they have more land contiguous. And just to point out too, available acreage is one thing, contiguous is another because that's actually the buildable site. On the other side, we looked at, you know, some of these sites are already pad ready, meaning that there is a pad ready for building as it sits right now. And then some of these have designations such as business ready certified, foreign trade zones, enterprise zones, and I do have a slide at the end where I can dig in a little bit deeper on that to talk about what those are, because I know that shows up as a disadvantage. And after doing it, I realized we probably need to dig into that a little bit. So at the end, I'll do that. We also looked at other rail surf sites, because when you're talking about competition and someone needs rail, who are you competing against? This one spreads over a larger area. When you need rail, especially a lot of rail, you're gonna look at a larger market area these sites represent those that have rail access or easy to um, acquire rail access. Again, we did the same analysis with these. Um, you can see in green those areas that there's an advantage. Again, red, some of those reds are much larger sites. Um, the green, there are a lot of these sites, rail surf sites are pretty far off the interstate, interstate which is an advantage to Santa Crossing. So, that was the analysis of competition. Into the second point, we wanted to look at what's actually happening, what announcements are being made so that we can see what types of industry are coming because you can think about what you wanna come and you can guess what you wanna come, but we dug in, we went through databases of VDP to find out what has been happening over the last five years. Um, and we went back to 17 to to make sure we got out of the COVID and the pandemic to get a, a, a better view. And what you can see here really is distribution, logistics, food, ag, manufacturing are some of those top announcements. And that makes sense. And those are targets for the business park. And I want to go back to the data center. When I talked about um, industries that may not be seeing as many announcements, and this being helpful, data centers, if you look there, there's been one announcement for data centers. What we see as an advantage here is, as Tim pointed out earlier, we see this as a good site for data centers. If we can make this the premier site for data centers, obviously there are not sites that are currently attracting that industry. This is a perfect target and a perfect opportunity for Stanton Crossing. And especially when um, I was at a conference not too long ago for data centers, and they talked about the need to expand out beyond Northern Virginia for a variety of reasons, cost, security, everything else. They're looking for opportunities to expand out away from that Northern Virginia circle. This is a perfect opportunity. And at the bottom, these are submissions. The top one's announcements. Those are projects that actually happened. The submissions are those times that Stanton Crossing made it into a final submission to go to a company for consideration. So that obviously is something we need to prove upon. Um, but I will point out this is a little misleading because these are final, these are final submissions to companies. It doesn't count when people like me put this out. This is just VDP. And it doesn't mean that there aren't times that this is recommended to VDP, 
but VDP has to make a cut. I do it, so I know other people are doing it. They will say to VDP, I want your top five sites. The VDP may get 20, and they have to wind it down to the top five. So what we need to do is to get in front of VDP and get the project to a point where it makes those top five submissions. So this is good information that lets us know where we need to work. We also did, as a part of that stakeholder group, we had, um, we had some meetings to talk about what that group saw as um, pros and cons, good and bad issues. And as part of the study, we also reached out to private sector site selectors like myself to get their input, people who actually work at the companies. And we came up with a, a variety of whether they're real or perceived, what people saw as opportunities and issues. And those are in the appendix in detail, in more detail. What I wanted to do here is talk about priorities for marketing. High priority means this, these areas may have come up as issues or concerns or things that could cause a question when you're looking to pick a site. And by all means, I wanna make sure that people understand when site selectors are out there, they're not, they're looking to end up with a site to choose but in the beginning of it, they're just looking for a reason to eliminate sites. When you go out and you ask a state, four states, five states to give you, you may come back with 40, 50, 60, 70 sites. You've got to whittle that down to something that's manageable. So in that first brush, and it often happens well before any of us know that they're even looking, they will eliminate sites. So what are the points that, and they may be perceived not real, that need high priority in marketing? site readiness. We need to market and show that this site is on the track. As Tim said, working towards tier four, we need to make that a part of the marketing. We really need to, to concentrate on those high priorities, development timelines, companies today want, they want to be there yesterday. So how are we going to address timelines and emphasize, emphasizing unique characteristics, making sure that all those, you know, that great visibility, that great access to the interstate, the rail, we need to make sure that's known. If you go to the other side, low priority, these are things we need to market, but we don't need to spend as much time because it's known or it's very obvious. That is the location, great access to the East Coast, the visibility from the interstate, wonderful visibility. Those are low priorities. Marketing targets. When you think of that, you think of, we need to make companies know that our site's out there, when actually there's a much larger marketing target list. First and foremost is internal partners. We need to make sure that the business industry, business and industry of the, the really the locality and the region know what's happening, what's going on, what the opportunity is. They have a lot of um, support. They may have suppliers, they may have other industries they work with that are looking to move we need to make sure that they understand what the opportunity is. And we need to make sure that internal, local and regional governments, like the Shenandoah Valley Partnership, who may put this out, we need to make sure that city council understands what's going on. The EDA knows what's going on. Because when it comes time for funding or when it comes time to bring a prospect in and cater to them and, and sell Stanton, we need to make sure that everyone's up to speed on what the opportunity is. State Economic Development Agencies, Virginia Economic Development Partnership, as I said earlier, they're the ones that make the recommendations. They need to know about it. Private industry, that kind of goes back to the first one as well, developers, and maybe most importantly, site selectors. In today's world, they make a lot of the decisions. So marketing to a CEO can be important, but making sure the people who are handing the information to the CEO, those are the people we want to get in front of. So taking all this analysis that I went through very quickly, we came up with some recommendations and um, some ideas about implementation. And we kind of put these in an order, there are eight of them, and we put them in the order we think we should start tackling them to make sure that we're on the right path. And I think it came out unanimously. The EDA talked about it. We had a big discussion. Developing a diverse internal marketing team for Stanton Crossing is important. It's that team that's the cheerleader for Stanton Crossing and for Stanton as a locality. 
and making sure that that team, when a prospect comes to town or when some BVP comes to town or site selector comes to town, that you can call upon them. They're informed about what's going on. They understand the importance of marketing the site. And they are the team that you want to put in front of a prospect. Um, you know, people like me, when I was at the city of Richmond, Amanda, it's our job to go out and promote and market. Having that come from a third party or from a, a CEO of a local industry or a, a nonprofit group, those are the ones that can make a big difference because that's not their job. They're there to talk about how great things are. Uh, we talked about this being, you know, the city of Stanton would lead this charge. Cost is about 2,500. We just did that because we think there'd probably be a kickoff, some kind of a regular meeting. So minimal cost to get something like that done. Second one, increase Stanton Crossing's online searchability, targeted site selection decision makers. Again, and I am a perfect example of it. When I have a company looking to relocate, the first thing I do before I even go to the states and ask for sites is I do my own search. And I know the general region that these companies want to be in. And I go online and start looking to see if I can find something that that gem that's hiding in there. So making sure that you are able to get your search criteria at the top of the list is important. And there are ways to do this through the website, the way you word things, what you include on your site, pictures, videos, the narrative, how the narrative is, how often you update the site, things like that affect whether you come up on the first page when you Google or whether you come up on a third page when you Google. And if you're coming up on a third page with a site selector, you're probably not even gonna get seen. So being searchable is extremely important. We recommend there an outside IT firm, social media consultant that does this for a living and understands how to do it, um, be brought in to, to increase that searchability. And we put a cost of 30,000 to kind of do some edits to the website, but also to work with advertising, Google ads, things that will make that searchability much better because that's where the site selectors begin and you can get eliminated before you even get started. Or to put it on a positive note, when they go to the state, they may say, I need your top five sites, something like Stanton Crossing. So that's, that's the positive side of it. Three, create a stronger presence for Stanton Crossing through social media outlets. Um, I can tell you right now, LinkedIn for site selectors, that's their platform. I look at site selection. I mean, I look at LinkedIn probably five times a day. I'm on there all the time. That's where I see what localities are doing with sites. What's a new site? what's happening, what's current. Um, almost every announcement in every state is put on LinkedIn. So you can see the minutes of my announces, you can see who they are, where they went and why they went there. So that's important to get your presence out there. Again, social media consultant can do that based on recent experience. It's about 10,000, um, you know, you can do anything from 2000 a month to make sure that somebody's hitting those social media accounts weekly responding and from those responses you can see who you're reaching how often you're reaching and how much they're sharing that's important create a targeting marketing portfolio again like i said in the beginning you can send flyers out to ceos all day they do need to see this but you want to target and you want to create that targeting market target marketing portfolio and keep it up to date keep it live keep it relevant who you want to be talking to um Obviously, that can be the charge can be led by the city of Stanton, which would be staff time, ten to twenty thousand. There are groups out there that will build a uh, marketing portfolio and maintain it for you, and even at times work on how you relay that information out. Most of the site, all the site selection selection consultants I talk to, and I agree, electronically is the way to go. You do want some printed materials, but um, when I get this in, I actually have a folder by state, by region, and I put these in there. And then as soon as somebody calls and says, I wanna look at the Shenandoah Valley, I'll pull those back out and start going through them. So we recommend bringing in an outside consultant to help a little bit with that. 10 to 20,000 would be the estimate. And the last four, build on current marketing material, create industry specific support material, concentrating on content, on data most important to those industries targeted. Uh, there is some great 
content out there already. What we're recommending here is to build upon that, not to replace it, but to build upon it and build marketing material that's specific to those target industries so that when you've caught the interest of a manufacturing group, you have the information relevant to them, which will be completely different than what's relevant to a data center. So when you respond to them, having that ready and having those pieces of information tailored to their industry, A, makes them know that you're serious and B, gets them the information they need. Um, City Stanton would work on doing this, but obviously an outside design firm would probably do the, the printing for print materials and the online um, versions that are so necessary. I can't tell you how many times I've sat on the side of a road in front of a grass field on my phone looking at content like this. So it needs to be ready for a phone, iPad, computer. It needs to be ready for everything. Number six, develop an ongoing campaign to disseminate news and updates focused on development and activity related to Stanton Crossing. Again, that goes back to that list of keeping people informed. And it's just as much for informing people like yourself as it is to site selection consultants. A, so they know what's going on. B, so you know what's going on. So that as needs come up, you're already aware of the situation. And that should be a regular update that goes out. Seven, improve the physical site visibility and appearance of Stanton Crossing from ID1. One of the wonderful attributes of the site is the visibility and the amount of traffic that goes up and down I-81. And the types of industries that would be attracted to a site like this, those people and those decision makers and those people that work in those industries are traveling up and down ID1. Your, some of your best advertising is the fact that they can see that site. And so maintaining the visibility, whether through signage, through lighting, um, when I worked for the city, I made sure that, you know, my code enforcement guys, my, my public utility people were keeping that site so that people would see it and be impressed by it. That's an ongoing type of thing. The cost will be determined by what you select to do and the city and park departments involved. And then last but not least, you kind of get everything in line, you get everything in order, you're ready because... You want to bring people to the site and let them see it firsthand. And the first thing they're going to do when they go away from that site is go back and look at everything in the first seven recommendations. But on this one, we're saying site selection decision makers spotlighting. So bringing them up here for a day or two, maybe around an important event that showcases the city, a, a, a Main Street Festival or some kind of sporting event. But at the same time, that shows them the vitality of the community. But you take them to the site. You let them meet that internal marketing team that we discussed back in part one. You host them for a night. Maybe you have a reception and bring in business leaders and others. We put that at 15,000. You know, we're recommending VDP is brought out one or two times and site selectors are brought out one or two times. You know, three to $4,000 is an estimate to get those done. Maybe we can take them to a Mary Baldwin University ball game. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, when you, when you go out to events like this, and I, I, I do attend these events as a site selector, it's great to do it around an event or something that showcases the community, something that, that the excitement's in the air that makes you want to be here. Um, I arrived fairly early today and walked around downtown while I was waiting. That's what you want to do is get them walking around downtown because it's impressive. But that's the kind of thing you need to do is get them here and let them walk around and look and see what's going on. Um, so those are the slides for the plan. I did want to, before questions or anything else, I wanted to hop back. Someone can put up that one slide for me. can't see that. So as we were wrapping this up and going through and looking at it, and I know there are some questions and really I looked at it too. When we did the analysis, you saw a lot of the red, which we considered potential disadvantages being over in the designation field. And for me, FTZ and EZ are things I hear every day, but not everybody hears that or knows what they are. So I did this quick slide, very basic to explain what those are, as well as a couple of others that will probably come up. Um, those, these are areas that would be addressed through the business plan. This is 
the marketing plan is one item from that business plan, but pursuing the opportunity to have these designations should be a step of your business plan. Business ready certified, that's what Tim talked about. That is something that Stan is working on now, working towards tier four status. Once you get to that, then you would have that box checked as business ready. So that would no longer be a disadvantage when compared to those other sites. So, you know, kudos for moving forward on that. That's what needs to be done. Foreign trade zones, you saw that one up there, FTZs. Those are designations. Uh, they're made by the foreign trade zone board. The commerce secretary is a chairperson and they're activated by customs and border protection. What that really is, most simple way to say it is, it's a building or a park or a zone where you can import product and you get to defer paying customs on those parts that are brought in. So you may bring in four, five, six different parts, pull them into something new and then ship that back out again. And only when you ship it back out and you're shipping it elsewhere, at that point do you pay. So as you're trying to attract international companies that would be bringing product in to, to build a, a bigger product or to assemble with products from the US, that foreign trade zone status would be important to them. That's something that you, it's actually an online application. There's some background to it where they have to come in, learn what you're doing, how you're doing it with the protection, security, things like that. But that process can be undertaken. Enterprise zones, you'll see those everywhere. I'm, you, actually, I'm sure you know about enterprise zones. That allows you to access two um, state grant-based incentives. One's about job creation and one's about real estate investment. And there is state money behind that. So when a prospect asks for an incentive proposal, those can be considered. Whereas if it's not an enterprise zone, they wouldn't be an option. But it also lets the locality come up with its own incentives as a part of that within the zone. So it allows you to access state money, but as well to give certain incentives in that zone that aren't elsewhere. Um, that's the, the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. Technology zones, kind of similar. They don't have the state money involved, but those are zones designated by the city, approved by city council that have incentives locally. And that's decided by city of Stanton, what you want to do, that's granted access to the General Assembly and it's a local ordinance to designate that zone along with the incentives. And then I included opportunity zones in here. That was not on the chart. And the reason being, but I know you will hear about opportunity zones. Those are areas designated in locality, really based around um, low income census tracts that were identified. And there are a certain number of those census tracts that can be incorporated into an opportunity zone. They're nominated by the governor and then they're signed off by the US Department of Treasury. When this program started a few years ago, several years ago, the governor nominated all the available opportunity zones for Virginia. So right now they are taken. There's not an opportunity to go out and create an opportunity zone. They are designated in Virginia until December 31st, 2028. So that's something we would want to look at down the road, but I wanted to point it out because I know you'll probably hear that, that terminology and when did you know what it was? So just a basic overview to explain those areas that showed up as red. That's my presentation and I went through it quickly. So if there are questions, we're here. I have a question. This is a friend of me. Oh, yes. Well, first, I, first, just so you know, Stanton has two census tracts that are already designated opportunity zones. Not unfortunately Stanton Crossing, but we do, we, we already, we're already in that uh, to some extent anyway. Um, I have a, you know, because you brought it up, I want to ask you a couple of things about the Lego investment. It's a billion dollar investment. And what I read was that Chesterfield County is, is providing $75 million of incentives. Is that correct? Yeah, this is Tim Davey. I don't have the um, exact numbers about what the county and the state are providing from the incentive perspective, but I can get you that information instead of just trying to go off the top of my head. But it well, was I think that's what I read. I figured since you were involved, you, you would you would know. But um. it absolutely was an incentivized project where both the state and the county um, put incentive packages in front of that project. Absolutely. And they are building a solar uh, plant that will power their facility essentially in, with the objective of making it carbon neutral. 
Yeah, they are they are committed to carbon neutrality. Um, the property is going to include some solar arrays um, that will obviously not fuel the facility, but will offset any of the power that they need to use in the facility. Two separate operations, but that's exactly one of their intents, yes. And so folks who are doing this site selection, are they looking for sites where they might have the opportunity to use solar panels uh, to, to uh, offset, you know, to affect that carbon footprint that they have? Is that, a, uh, is that one of the things they're looking for? Well, in the mission critical, we're seeing a lot of that. Another project that was incentivized uh, in Virginia uh, where Facebook agreed to build a data center in Henrico County, they actually required that Dominion commit to building a solar farm equal to the size of the usage of the data center. So that wasn't something where they needed it to be on site, but it was something that they required the power company to provide as an incentive. So more and more companies are becoming uh, energy conscious and trying to be more sustainable. And so we have to understand exactly what it is that's driving some of their decisions and be in a position to, to go ahead and react to that. And the ROI analysis that's on your list, that would, that would is essentially the purpose of that to uh, calculate the kind of return the city would need on uh, an investment that a company was making in order to justify uh, uh, financial incentives it, it, or to give you some sort of direction on how much financial incentive uh, incentive you could offer? Yeah, so we're, we're in a situation, obviously, with a publicly owned site that you actually have got the biggest incentive stick sort of at your disposal and the fact that you may be asked to contribute land. You might be asked to donate the land um, for zero dollars. Um, we wouldn't ask you to do that without having actually an ROI analysis that actually supported why you would choose to do that. And obviously the machinery and tools tax could be it, the jobs could be it. Uh, and so, yeah, making sure that for certain investment levels, you're prepared with your toolkit to yeah. make sure you can understand how you can either slide the price per acre that you're willing to go ahead and allow that land to be contributed or do things like Lee mentioned by implementing some of these other economic development tools. So that's one of the elements of the business plan that we still think will be important uh, to try to do. As Lee mentioned and Amanda mentioned, the priority of the marketing plan was equally as important in our opinion, because we wanna make sure that our site is in as many site searches as possible, especially right now with the acceleration of the number of prospects that are out there looking for right now. And in order to really attract a significant investment, um, you're, it, it's not likely that waiving utility hookup fees is going to be it. Well, that's exactly incentives, right. Well, I mean, it, that, that's exactly that. I mean, the, yeah. the way that's always been explained to me, and, and Lee is one of those experts, is is incentives don't make a bad site good; they just make a good site better. So we're focused on making this site as great as possible, which is why Lego picked the site in Chesterfield. It was a great site uh, and it was ready to go. That's why they picked that site. There was another announcement today um, about a company and this kind of goes to the data center uh, uh, discussion that, um, that uh, uh, was mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, in um, Loudoun County, a company called Hanley Energy is making a, an, an $8 million investment in new capacity and they're adding 343 new jobs for elect electricians and apprentices. Um, and, and, and the announcement talked about Loudoun County um, as being the epicenter of the data center industry. It talked about having a global reputation as a data center uh, destination, talked about a strong tech talent pipeline. Uh, Loudoun County is known as data center alley, apparently, in some circles. Um, it's a top destination for data centers in the nation. And, and uh, an astounding 70% of the world's internet traffic flows through Loudoun's data center, uh, plural, data centers. So, so um, you know, that, that's, that's a massive amount of, of data to, to flow through the uh, internet traffic to, to flow through one, one place. It, but is it really... Is it realistic uh, to, um, to think that, you know, we could draw some of that data center traffic down? And is it because of the issue? Because it's exactly because there are so many data centers there that, they, that it's a security issue? I mean, what's your thinking on that? 
Well, so Dominion is really the, the entity that sort of led us to this thinking about data centers because Dominion has built a program to try to diversify the data centers out of that alley. So Dominion serves many more areas of the Commonwealth of Virginia other than Northern Virginia. And they saw about 10 years ago where they had an opportunity to try to diversify that and getting, getting them across part of their system. The Facebook data center in Richmond is an outcome of them actually diversifying and trying to make sure that they were marketing data centers in other areas. The reason why data centers are on our business development or our business uh, plan is because Dominion serves your site. Unique to this part of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Dominion doesn't serve everything up and down 81, but they do serve the site, which is why data centers surfaced as a priority for us. And, and uh, another question, you mentioned in the presentation that uh, we needed a diverse internal marketing team. When you say diverse, what does that look like to you? Lee, do you wanna talk about that? And I'm sorry, I didn't, if I, if I hit a button that pulled the slides away, I apologize. Oh. If we need to pull that back up again, we might need some help. No, what I was referring to is the diverse marketing team. It kind of can be modeled somewhat after the stakeholder group we pulled together for this project. So that you have uh, private sector, private industry, you have people from the field of education, you know, community college, workforce training. You, you, you want to have people can speak to what it's like to do business here. Um, a lot of prospects want, you know, as a part of that team, um, nonprofits to talk about how the community supports its nonprofit world. So it really needs to be diverse as far as private sector, public sector. Um, you know, when I was in the city of Richmond, uh, one of our projects we had there was Stone Brewery, which was, I think they started off with, you know, every state east of the Mississippi. And I remember we built this team there mm -hmm. for the, exactly this purpose. And when we got down to the final three, they came for a visit, we had a reception for them. And even on that team at that point, when you get that close to the end, we had um, the fire chief, the police chief on that team. And they knew they had the talking points before they went there because they can address issues like safety. Um, so diverse means people in all sectors, public, private, nonprofit, that can be knowledgeable about the opportunity. So what you're saying is that you're not necessarily looking at diversity and we've been doing diversity work in the city. Um, diversity to you does not mean you're putting a, um, a group of people whose faces aren't all white and who aren't all 50 and 60 and 70 years old. I mean, so I, that, that's, you know, if, if you could refine that just a little bit, I'd appreciate it. No, you're, you are absolutely right. Um, it needs to be diverse in exactly the way you spoke about it. Um, you know, you hit on one of the two points I want to make there. One is having, you know, in today's world, the entrepreneurial world, the, the, the young people that are getting out there and starting businesses, it's great to have, you know, young entrepreneurial type people on this. And I, I'm working with a prospect right now that's from the West Coast. Uh, we're doing a multi-state search for a new facility so they can expand to the East Coast from the West Coast. It would be their first plant outside the West Coast. The first meeting we had, they brought up that they wanted to be in a community that was diverse. They wanted a diverse workforce and they wanted a community that, that they felt comfortable could meet that, meet that requirement. And I, and I promise I just have one more question. <laughs> I'm sorry to monopolize your time, but so um, you mentioned uh, making sure that the marketing approaches uh, is integrated with, um, well, I think, as I understand it, you know, what I'm, what I'm asking about is, will this approach integrate what is already bringing people to Stanton? I mean, we have a great tourism department that, that, uh, that really, we get accolades as, you know, having, being the best place to retire and the most beautiful city to live in. And, the, you know, we, we, we get tons of accolades from Southern living and places like that. Is that is it important that we integrate those accolades, those achievements into this marketing plan for Stanton Crossing or are people just looking for a piece of real estate? The answer is yes, you want, you want to have that as a part of it. 
um, a lot of site searches will, will start off with where can I go that I can actually make it work. I, I have to have 100 acres. I have to have rail served and it has to be on the interstate. So that's the driving piece. I've got to have that. Well, you do that search, you might come up with 25. It, that's, that's where you're looking for reasons to eliminate. You don't have 100 acres. You don't have rail, you, you know, whatever that is. You, you look for reasons to eliminate. You come up with, with a list of, let's say, 25. At that point, then you switch gears and you start looking at, okay, out of this 25, what areas, they all, they all meet the criteria. We can build a building in any of these. So where do we want to be? And like Tim said, incentives are at the very end. That's at the end of the funnel. What's in the middle of that funnel, the top of the funnel is the characteristics. The middle of the funnel is, can this locality, can this region give the people that work at my facility, the lifestyle that they want to have, that I want them to have. And that's where you start looking at the attractions, the tourism, the location, things like that. That, that whittles down that 25 to your top five, 10 prospects. Then when you get down into the, I got five, they all are in wonderful places to live. I can attract the workforce I want. The site works the bottom of that funnel when you're down in that five that's when the incentives come in great thank so. you so much i appreciate all the information right are there any additional questions councillor holmes um do they look at the uh the available workforce um you know during these times everybody is just really strapped to get people to work and would they bring a lot of their own people or would they bring maybe the top tier and then and then fill it out with locals here because we we do have a lot of colleges here in this area and universities that turn out a lot of students that would probably be great employees for these places so is that a major uh, uh draw for us also that yes absolutely that would be in that top tier so when you're looking at when you're looking at i need 100 acres i need this you're also going to look at the workforce and that's a reason to eliminate. I don't think I can get the workforce here to support my business. So that is that is one of the ones that can get you eliminated, which is why that needs to be on there. That was in that medium priority list. I, as a site selector, can look at where you're located and look at the educational opportunities nearby and understand that it's there. So it's not a high priority as in there's nothing around. How are you gonna solve that problem? So it's more of a medium priority, but yes, in that top, here of I'm going to eliminate sites to get to my 25 that is definitely right up there with 100 acres and everything else um, and then once you come down to what the council member was just talking about a minute ago where do I work where do I live where do I play can this sustain my workforce that's when you start getting into that 25 and who gets eliminated from that 25 which this area is in a, a, a great location to survive that cut it's just we need to make sure people know about it because you don't know what you don't know. All right. Anything else? So it sounds like a key component is to um, be on the radar for the uh, Virginia Economic Development Partnership in the top five. And that, that's right. key. key. Key and the site selectors. Yes. Those, those two are the number one source of leads. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate the um, presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Good to see you again. All right, that takes us to item D, Madam Mayor. Well, Madam uh, Mayor. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, we got a vote on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got lost in your presentation. It was you did such a great job. Councillor Dole. I move the city council approve the draft Stanton Crossing marketing plan strategy. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second that, Mayor. All right, Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Ms. Mead? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Ms. Dole? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. And again, thank you for the presentation. Excellent job. All right, now we can go on to item D. An update on the Centralized Recycling Center pilot program. Ms. Uh, Mr. Jeff Johnson, Public Works Director, will um, handle this item this evening. Welcome. And I believe he also has a presentation. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> yep, right here. Presentation. Evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, it has been a while since uh, we've talked recycling. Uh, it is difficult to get to the podium during budget season. Uh, so uh, I'll be talking about some stats through March um, and actually we'll probably be back pretty soon with uh, the results of the next quarter as well. This is a somewhat abbreviated version. Um, I've eliminated the background slides. I'm assuming that uh, everyone is up to speed. We'll get right into the numbers. Um, our visit data is, you can see, has a few asterisks at the end. We'll talk a little bit about labor when we get uh, to that slide. But we were scrambling to keep the uh, recycling center open in February and March. And uh, there were days when we just didn't have good counts. I was able to extrapolate uh, some of the missing days based on, on other data, but those numbers are certainly uh, suspect. Uh, what that has caused us to realize is all that data is sort of suspect. It's not a, uh, visits is not a really good metric of participation because I don't know how many of those are unique visits, how many of those are repeat visits. Uh, and so those numbers are, are awfully confusing. I'm not sure what we were going to do with them, um, uh, but it would appear that the dip in December may have been seasonal based on these numbers. Uh, when we get into some of the collection figures, uh, I think that's, it's a little bit clearer there. So there are collection numbers and they are just a hot mess. They are all over the place. It has a lot to do with the fact that we turn uh, materials in in bulk, sometimes once only once or twice a month. And if that turn in happens on the 31st of one month or the first of the next month, it, it sort of skews the data. But at this point, we've been doing it long enough that I was able, I'm able to start doing some three month rolling averages to sort of smooth out some of those radical peaks. Um, uh, and here's where I think is a much more realistic read that uh, we did see a seasonal dip in the winter and we are coming out of it this spring um, with a relatively uh, sustained and steady climb. Um, uh, so uh, again, a little bit easier to get a feel that we are sort of settling in on uh, a steady state, but our steady state does have a good uh, aspirational aspect to it as we continue to grow. Uh, we're still racking and stacking fairly consistently with our neighbors up in Harrisonburg. Um, uh, we continue uh, to collect a freakishly large amount of glass. Uh, that number is not coming. I thought over time that that number would come back down. It is not. We continue to uh, collect on a per capita basis three to four times as much glass as Harrisonburg. Um, I also say that our aluminum numbers uh, are surprisingly high. Uh, we were told by more than one uh, quote unquote expert that once you go to central turn in, you don't see aluminum anymore because people can get money for their aluminum and they won't bring it to us for free when they can bring it somewhere else for money. Uh, we are not seeing that. Uh, so we are uh, surprisingly out collecting uh, Harrisonburg on aluminum as well. Not complaining. Just pointing out the oddity. Yeah. Um, all right, we'll get into some of our cost and efficiency. So our labor situation is better in that we are seeing applications. We are getting people who want to come work at uh, recycling. Uh, but it is certainly not stable. Uh, a lot of turnover. We've been through five attendants since the last time I was up here speaking with you. And that does not include the one who quit before his first day and the two who blew us off for their interviews, uh, it, is still, uh, it, is, it is still an effort. But uh, six months ago, we weren't even seeing applications. So uh, it is getting better. On the non-labor side, if you've been out to the recycling center recently, you've noticed that we've increased the number of dumpsters that we're using and reduced the number of trucks. It makes, the, it, makes it much easier for folks uh, to use, much easier to figure out what goes where, um, but that has driven up our handling costs. We have more dumpsters to pull uh, and we're pulling them uh, on a very frequent basis. Uh, obviously the more material we get, the sooner the dumpsters fill up, the more often they have to be hauled. Uh, and previous updates are our revenue from our recyclable materials. We're just about covering our handling costs. Well, that is no longer the case. Handling costs at this point are uh, 
a little bit higher than our revenue, but uh, we are still within our FY23 budget for our FY22 budget uh, heading into our, and if things, if we don't get too busy, we'll be fine in 23 as well. But uh, the additional costs certainly anecdotally uh, have had huge benefits in terms of the feedback we get from our customers on how much uh, easier, faster, uh, and simpler it is for them to give us their materials. Oh, my favorite slide, because we're always learning things at recycling. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the space. I mentioned before that Gypsy Hill Park is really not an ideal place to have the recycling center. Uh, well, I can add another, another stick to that smoldering fire. Uh, we are going to have to fully demobilize the recycling center for a happy birthday America on the holiday weekend, which means we'll be closing early on, fr on uh, Friday the 1st, pulling all the trucks, all the dumpsters, all the barricades uh, to accommodate the festivities there, and then rebuilding it all afterwards so we can reopen on the 6th. Uh, we will take advantage of that opportunity to open up with a slightly smaller footprint. With more dumpsters, we can be a little more efficient. I can give some parking spaces back to Parks and Rec, uh, which I know uh, as they get into this season, they will like. Um, but we were closed for the fishing derbies. We've had to completely relocate for this. Uh, we're just not a good neighbor for our friends at Gypsy Hill Park. Uh, there's a lot going on uh, and it creates extra work for us, extra work for them. On the security standpoint, I got some photos. These, this is sort of what things look like a lot of mornings when we rock up to the recycling center. Um, uh, folks have left stuff for us. Uh, I don't, we, some maybe with the best of intentions, maybe not with the best of intentions. Either way, uh, it all has to be tidied up and, and tossed before we can get opening. And then on the bottom photo, sometimes they just, they just get into the truck and mess with stuff. Um, it's an issue. It's more of an issue now because obviously there's a lot more foot traffic in Gypsy Hill Park now than there is in the middle of winter. Uh, it's just another indication that it's probably not, we really do need a place where uh, maybe that's a little bit out of the way with the fence we can lock so that we can uh, just keep that from happening. Uh, and lastly, I've been having a lot of conversations with my counterparts in Augusta County and Waynesboro. I've, I've been, they've been talking with me ever since we started. Um, and uh, they are both considering adding plastic into their recycling programs. Now they have their own hurdles to clear, they have their own issues to deal with, uh, but if they get back in that game, uh, that would open up the door to some regional opportunities. Some, you know, This is, at the end of the day, an economy of scale business, uh, and working together, uh, we might be able to create some economies of scale that would benefit all of us. Uh, it's not on the slide, but I'm also participating uh, this summer in an online uh, webinar group with a number of uh, small and rural uh, local governments throughout the country uh, to talk about recycling. Uh, on, on most days, it seems like more of a support group than a webinar as we all commiserate on, on what's going on. But uh, uh, we, uh, at every level, my level, even down with the folks uh, who uh, the attendance center at the recycling center, we always have our ears open and our antennas up uh, to think about new ways that we can improve our efficiencies, uh, effectiveness, um, and, and make things better. Mr. Johnson, I have a quick question. Is the, is the, um, the, the fact that oil prices have gone up the way they have, is that, is that an incentive to other localities to begin plastics recycling? In other words, making virgin plastic more expensive and recycled plastic a better economic opportunity? Uh, that's, at, at this point, that has not trickled down to the commodity prices we're getting. Uh, when we turn in, in plastic, uh, but uh, obviously the larger of a player you are, the sooner you see the impacts of those larger market forces. So uh, again, uh, throwing, our, throwing ourselves together with uh, the county and, and with Waynesboro, we might pick up on some of those sooner. But right now we're, we, we have not seen any significant changes in the prices we're seeing for plastic. Um, our conclusions, kind of the same thing I said last time I was up here, uh, we will continue to make uh, incremental improvements, uh, uh, keep working away on our staffing, make changes, uh, improve efficiencies as we see them. Uh, I will say that uh, it has been 10 days 
now, 10 days in a row that we've had the same two people down at recycling, so we're off to a good start. Uh, once we get put back together again after the 4th of July, if in fact we still, and we can maintain our labor, that will be an opportunity to look at expanding hours. Uh, and and uh, so hopefully, you know, really it is at this point, labor is the final piece of that puzzle that will give us the one. I don't wanna make promises to the public that we can't keep. But if the labor seems uh, steady, then we'll start expanding our hours. Lastly, because people ask me this all the time uh, when I talk about the pilot program is when will this stop being a pilot program? Um, and at this point, uh, we're generating enough data that the FY 2024 budget for recycling will include a recommendation on a, uh, a full program. So to mature, to mature the program from a pilot program into a more of a long-term effort. Great. Any questions? I, I have one. I'm sorry. Councillor Holmes. Why would you think uh, the, the metal would jump so much from April to, to September? It looks like metal has a big hump there where it goes up. And then is that people turning in like up? Uh, appliances and stuff like that or or i think that might be the glass oh that's a glass i think that might be the glass uh like oh, i said sorry. yes we are i am at a loss to explain where all this class is coming from we just drank more in chat yeah when it's warm you drink uh, that's, that's, I've, that's, I've said this before but the folks in harrisburg say that the College students can't afford to drink out of bottles, so they don't get they don't they don't get any. That's aluminum. So they get a lot of red solo cups and aluminum. Um, <laughs> I'll say also we've been we're starting to push out the closure during Happy Birthday America because it is unusual. But if somebody tries to go over there to recycle, they're going to be unpleasantly surprised. So they'll figure it out rather quickly. But we started pushing it out. So. No service between noon Friday and opening up at the six, which is a Wednesday, which is unusual because we're not usually open on Wednesday, but they will be open on Wednesday for that week to get going again. So, yeah, we're expecting quite a bow wave of yeah. uh, uh, Tuesday uh, mm -hmm. of things uh, to come in after the long holiday weekend. Have we had any um, luck finding a different site or any place that would be more? Uh, because I don't think any of us like having it in a park. I mean, it's just. Uh, there's a, a number of ideas that have been floated around, but uh, at, at this point, uh, we haven't really pursued anything. Uh, when we start putting together a final recommendation, armed with you know a full years of data with all the seasonal variances, uh, and hopefully maybe with some uh, uh, additional help from the neighbors on what they're doing, um, uh, a site will certainly have to be part of that final recommendation. Don't even think about Stanton Crossing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, now I now I'm gonna now I can't think of anything but Stanton Crossing. Um, no, we've got there's a number uh, a, a, a number again. It's it's very funny. I, I I was kind of listening to the previous brief. A lot of the same things we've been talking about is we you know we've got our criteria. What would make a good recycling site? You know, our high priority issues or low priority issues, and we'll find we'll find a spot. Um, Seems but, to be a lot of parking available or parking lot available at one of the federated auto places. Mm -hmm. That whole shopping center used to be the old uh, Walmart and, and uh, Lowe's, but uh, I don't know. There's never vehicles there. I don't know if that would ever be something that we could work out with them. Yeah, and we'll take a look at pretty much every flat available spot in town. Uh, we're gonna get serious. Yeah, we're gonna like start digging in way before the budget process right, right, right. starts. Like, well, well, again, we're gonna <laughs> we're, uh, come come to the budget season with a proposal that has got uh, a lot of details to include location. So, so we're gonna have reliable data starting in June. So we're gonna have maybe six months of semi-reliable data. Correct. Before uh, but before it's budget time, we've got, we'll have a year of data. We'll have a we'll have a year of collection data. Over we'll have eighteen months of collection data by the time the budget goes together. Even though it's not reliable, the partici the the visit the participation data is not going to be reliable. <clears throat> and other other than the fact and that will there be solutions for the elderly, disabled, parents uh, with young children? People that don't own a car, 
uh, because they're still paying for recycling and they can't participate. So that proposal should include the solution for all those people. I will take that under investment as well. That's certainly one of the sites, uh, site criteria is, uh, uh, you know, and the, the labor function of it to expand the hours to get the folks who can't get there during our current hours. I've always heard cardboard is a big money maker, but I would suspect it would be hard to keep it from being contaminated. Uh, we do a pretty good job with cardboard because yeah. we have a tent because we have a, a tended facility. It's uh, our, we can keep a good eye on what's going into the cardboard truck. Yeah. Uh, our uh, our refuse packer serves as a pretty good baler. We can we can get a lot of cardboard into that truck before we have to take it in. So it makes it fairly efficient. But no, cardboard is a is is uh, is a pretty good money maker. Okay, good. All right. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you know. Ready? The next item is item. E, a presentation by Valley Community Service Board. Ms. Beauregard. Yes, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kimberly McClanahan, Executive Director of Valley Community Services Board, who is here this evening to um, talk about some of the goings on at the VS, at the um, Valley, the Community Services Board, excuse me, the CSB. Um, and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your patience. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. This is going to be a little bit different than what you've been hearing, uh, although we will talk about disabilities and that kind of thing. Um, so I thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am Kim McClanahan. For those of you who may not have been here when I was here maybe a year and a half ago, I've been on the job for about six months at that point, knew nothing uh, and know a little bit more now. Uh, having been here for almost two years. Uh, but I did want to thank you for uh, giving us the 10% match that we asked for for uh, this next fiscal year. We really appreciate that. We also appreciate the board members that you have uh, presented us with. Ross Parker, who's actually going to be our board chair uh, come July, Anna Levitt and Nich our doozy. And we are Cynthia Burnett and Linda Sizik, who have been on our board for the last six years, rotate off this month. So we need two more uh, whenever y'all get around to uh, thinking about that. So we'll be, we're, we'll be down two. And I don't think that there have been, I was asking today, I don't think anybody's been appointed yet. So we look forward to that. Um, got a little agenda and I'll just ask after each item whether or not there are any questions. And uh, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about what we've done in Stanton. As you probably know, or may not know, uh, Valley Community Services Board serves four localities, Stanton, Waynesboro, Augusta County, and then Highland County over the mountain. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what we've done in Stanton last year, as well as just to give you a snapshot of what we're doing this year. So in calendar year 2021, we served 1,729 people from Stanton, and that was about the same number as we served in calendar year 2020. And wanted to know the money that you all provide us through the 10% match, we have chosen to use primarily for medical psychiatric services. As you might guess, uh, physicians, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, very expensive and usually don't pay for themselves. So we generally put the funding that you folks provide to us towards those uh, under, under insured or uninsured or to some of the people, the providers salary. So we appreciate that. Um, and I would want you to know that this year, however, you know, we always expect a loss with the medical services. Uh, this year we were expecting about a $300,000 loss, uh, but they're, they're doing what I call under losing uh, this year and have only lost about 70,000. So uh, we've become a little bit more efficient with what we're doing. I also think that because of the pandemic, there was the uh, addition of the ability to do uh, just telephone only services in the prescribing world. And that has eliminated so many problems for people who don't have transportation, don't have internet, all those kinds of things. So they actually show up for their appointments. So that means that if they are insured, we are then able to bill and that may be part of why we're under losing uh, in that. Um, let me give you a quick snapshot of what we've been doing this year. And this is just for the month of May. 
uh, in, in May, we served 123 clients from Stanton, uh, 58 males and 65 females. And interestingly, almost half of those were children between the ages of three and 18. I, I found that very, very interesting that we serve a lot of children from this community. The other half uh, were 19 to 59 year olds. So we didn't serve any uh, elderly uh, in the month of May for wh whatever reason. The large majority of those clients were white. The large majority have never had any military experience. Uh, we provided 161 group therapy services, 127 individual therapy services, 26 family therapy services, 38 intakes, and 59 substance use IOP, intensive outpatient services. Uh, if you're interested, the most common diagnosis for Stanton was other stimulant abuse. Uh, followed by anxiety disorders and then major depressive disorders. Um, so we're not talking huge amount of numbers of people, but the, the most like 20 had uh, the stimulant abuse uh, diagnosis. So any questions about that before I move on? You think uh, that the, the reason uh, you might be having uh, uh, younger people would be maybe because of COVID and, and and the things that you know everybody had to go through with not going to school and and having to re re interact with people again would that be I, I certainly think that's a great hypothesis and you know there's a lot of literature out there and a lot of evidence that our younger folks are having a really hard time uh with the pandemic and what has uh, what they've been through as you know what we've been through uh think about you know three to 18 year olds going through a similar thing. So I, th I think that's a, a really good uh, uh, idea and probably is some of what we're saying. Uh, any other questions about that? Well, I had a question. Are you providing services <clears throat> in our school system at all? Yes, we are. Do you have any data on that? Uh, I don't have, yes, but not with me. Okay. Uh, I'd be happy to get you some. I I'm not sure what you, exactly you would like. I just wondered how, how, how much service is provided because that we don't have uh, social workers or counselors or anything employed by the school system. Right. So it has to come from somewhere else. So I'm yeah, sure. well, well, Valley Duh is in, in the schools and I'm sure that a good number of the kids that I'm talking about are in schools uh, as opposed to coming into the office or doing telemedicine. Uh, and I can, I can, I mean, I, we can pull that data from our uh, ele electronic health record. Uh, if you're interested in having me follow up and send it to Ms. Beauregard, I'd be happy to. Well, that'd be fine, thanks. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, I hope I didn't lie. I think we can get it out of our EHR. I'm, I'm not a data guru, however, um, but I, I will do my best to tell you how many we're seeing, what schools, well, we might not have it broken down by schools, but I can certainly tell you where we saw them and if it was a school setting. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, oh, any other questions about that? Okay. Uh, Valley did strategic planning about a year ago, and that was the first time Valley done strategic planning in about 10 years. Uh, so uh, we, I want to talk just a bit, our fifth goal is really about community relations and doing things in the community so that we can enhance our uh, public persona, of course, and even do better partnership than, than we do, but I think we have great partners already. Uh, but of relevance to Stanton is that we are gonna encourage, I can't do that, it's a board thing, uh, but one or more of the members that you have appointed to our board to come to one of your meetings at least quarterly so that that person can come back and report to us about what's going on in the city and what you guys are working on. And then as I am now, once a year coming, at least once a year to kind of give you an update on what Valley's doing and, and that sort of thing for me or while I'm here, I would be doing that. Um, we also hope, although it hasn't happened yet, to have kind of a quarterly newsletter that we'll be sending out to our uh, constituents at the counties and cities, as well as elected officials. Um, we're not there yet because we don't have the right staff person to do that yet, but we're, we're hopeful. That's a part of our outreach. Any questions about that? Yeah, no, not much to say about that. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our budget. Uh, when I came a year and a half ago or so, uh, Valley was coming out of a pretty bad financial uh, state, as you may recall. Uh, so let me 
tell you good news. Uh, so our FY22 budget, which we're just ending this obviously in June, our May surplus was $3,415,954. So pretty huge. Now, uh, so why, you might ask, I mean, that's great. We're really excited about it. Uh, but there are reasons for that, the pandemic being one of them, uh, because uh, unfortunately, when times are bad, mental health uh, gets a boost, right, of mental health providers, uh, because there are all kinds of things that are going on with people, substance use, depression, anxiety, all the things that, that we you all know about, uh, the trauma, that sort of thing. So for FY23, we are expecting a similar uh, surplus. Um, but we are, if we weren't providing a 5% cost of living adjustment to our staff, which we, as our budget was approved last night, uh, we are, know that we're gonna be able to provide the staff a 5% cost of living adjustment. Now, when you read in the paper about state employees getting a 5% adjustment, that's not us. We are not state employees. Now, you might even read that it applies to community service boards. It sort of does. But what we'll end up with is about 1.5% of that 5%. So that the, and it's too complicated to even get into, but when you read that everybody's getting 5%, we're not. So we're uh, supplementing all that for our operating capital. But we will take the 1.5%. I've never turned that down for sure. Um, so what we're predicting because of the 5% cost of living is about 1.7 million for uh, FY23. And if we are on target with our projections, we will also try to do a market adjustment for our staff come January. So meaning if we haven't completely gone out of our minds and lost a bunch of money in the first six months of the year, we'll actually be able to hopefully bring some of our staff up to the market level. Uh, because as you are probably aware, we don't pay that well. <laughs> so we're, tr we're trying to be competitive and it's very hard to be competitive. You've heard about workforce tonight. Uh, it is endemic in uh, behavioral health field. And lots of people now can do, if they're licensed professional, they can do it all online. So they can go to a, a, another company and do all of their therapy online, never leave their house. Uh, community service boards, that doesn't work that way. So, so we're competing not only with higher uh, you know, salaries or however they're being paid, but we're competing with that notion of everybody got used to staying at home in the last two years, right? So we're competing with that, but we're hoping to do a market adjustment. So let me just give you a, a little bit of context for where we're at now as opposed to where we were when I got here. Uh, so in FY21, that was the first year I was at Valley, we had a 1.4 million surplus. In contrast to FY20, where there was a loss of 740,000, FY19, a loss of 185,000, FY18 uh, had a surplus of 32,501, which is pretty much a break even. And then uh, in 17, a loss of 667, and 16, a loss of 657. So we're doing a lot better than we were a few years ago. We're really excited about that. Uh, some of the reasons, uh, you know, Medicaid expansion helps us. I think we do have fewer employees because, you know, as a part of that financial crisis, there was a lot of cutting. That was before I got here, but it was cut to the bone. Uh, we're slowly rebuilding uh, back to uh, more staff, but it's hard to get staff. So part of our surplus is about uh, the unexpended salary and benefits because we don't have people coming in the door as, as, we, as we might. Um, do want you to say that at this time last year, we had accumulated about $5 million in the bank. This year, we're at 9 million. Uh, now, 3.6 of that we are required to have as a part of our performance contract with the state. They require us to have two months of operating cash uh, in reserve in case the world comes to an end uh, and we need to have that. So we're really excited. We didn't have that for the last few years. So we're really excited to have that. So any questions about the finances and the budget, if you are interested in seeing it, it will be posted on our website in the next couple of days. The ones that the one that was uh, approved last night. Any questions? Councilor Holmes. You have a lot of turnover because burnout in your, in your field. I would think that 
you know, that would be something that would really be a, a problem. There is, yes, I'm, certainly there is, there is that. Uh, and um, we, we try to, and when you're understaffed, uh, you're more likely to burn out sooner because you're taking on tasks that you wouldn't necessarily be, you'd be taking on the same task, but you're taking on more of it. So the stress is more. Um, and like I said, a big part of the turnover that we're seeing uh, is really about going somewhere where I can sit at home on, on my couch and do therapy all day. Uh, but yes, that is clearly something. And the other thing is that just in terms of getting people on board nationwide, behavioral health is under siege for not having people going into the field because uh, everybody like to make some money. So they go into IT or business or, or whatever. So you've really, at this point, I think people really have to have a, a heart for it and it's the mission that they do and particularly in community behavioral health because we are working with those folks with the most serious problems and the fewest resources so it's hard work every day and the people that we see doing it my staff uh they have a heart for it uh, they don't come to work for the money they come for the mission so and that's always encouraging but we like to give them a little bit more money so they can live uh, a decent life. Um, okay, I'm gonna, you all know about Marcus Alert. Okay, so you know you know that the latest uh, iteration uh, is essentially said, you guys don't have to do it. The localities with under 40,000 are not obligated by law to implement it. That doesn't mean you can't, it's not a good thing, and we'll be there to help if that's something you choose to do, but you are not obligated. The only one of our localities obligated is Augusta County because they're 80,000. So <clears throat> the only other thing I wanted to chat about real quick is uh, one of our programs. Uh, and I was specifically asked by my director of developmental services to talk about this program. Uh, and it's the infant and toddler connections. And these are programs that provide, I'm going to they wrote this for me, so I'm gonna read a little bit. Provides early intervention services to children birth to age three who are experiencing a de developmental delay. You may or may not know that we saw in the past 11 months, 130 children from Stanton with these issues and 90 of those children are receiving direct services from our staff, our very limited staff in this program. It is a part of, uh, and, and development, Develop, develop, boy, I think I have a developmental delay. Anyway, maybe uh, autism, maybe uh, cerebral palsy, maybe Down syndrome, maybe any number of things. But if a child at a certain age is not within a certain percentile of where they should be, they become eligible for these kinds of services. And the services that we don't provide, we refer out to other people like physical therapy, occupational therapy. We don't have those folks uh, employed, we contract with them. Um, Who's referring them to you? Like pediatricians? Pediatricians, fam family members, uh, just, yeah, anybody can refer, but a, a lot of them come from families themselves. Sometimes, I've, in fact, we just had a, 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 a presentation on this today at one of our leadership uh, meetings, and the, the Stacy Jackson, who heads up the infant toddler program, was telling about a circumstance of one child who was seven months old, had all kinds of things going on that every, all these agencies were involved. Everybody thought that the other person had referred her to Valley for the infant toddler program, nobody had. So the parents themselves actually called up and said, we need help. Uh, so that's how we got them. But we really just, anybody can do it. And uh, yes, pediatricians do it and families do it a lot. Uh, and in the state of Virginia, it's a pretty small program. Uh, there are about 12,000 children who uh, get it throughout the state. What we do, we see a hundred or so people here and another hundred or so in Waynesboro. Uh, and Augusta County has its own thing in the school. Anyway, it's a part of uh, part C of the IDEA Act, which entitles children to a, a free education, an appropriate education, and it is an unfunded mandate. 
Um, so in Virginia, we get some funds from the state, some from federal, as well as billing and family fees, but they consistently fall short of what is needed. And this service is not one that we are able to get, give any of your 10% to. It's the law. I don't know why that is. Um, so if you have extra money hanging around, uh, the infant and toddler program would love to have some. Uh, we need additional support to adequately serve our community's youngest citizens. So I did want to put that out there. I didn't know if you were even familiar with that program. Uh, and I know that we also had requested some ARPA funds for a, a program in the DD world, but I haven't heard anything about that from you guys yet. So, uh, and I'm not asking you to tell me now, but. Well, I think CAPSAW would be a, a really good source, the Community Action Partnership. Oh, for the infant toddler? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a, a good thought. I will. Anna, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to Anna about it. Uh, well, if, it if they won't take local funds, those are local funds. Well, they're local, state, and federal. So. But they, they won't, they cannot take, okay. So the localities are required by law to provide, to match 10% of what CSBs get from the state. And that's that formula that I send you guys every year. Now, not all localities do it, uh, but it is the law. So but of that, those particular dollars, for whatever reason that I cannot tell you, this program cannot access those. I don't know why. Some kind of, I'm sure, strange regulation or law. So that that's, uh, but some CSBs do get some money from their localities, but it's aside from the, the 10%. Yeah. And yes. So how much is the 10% that we're uh, matching? What is the actual dollar total? Do we know? Yeah, I do. I don't have it in my, I bet uh, Ms. Beauregard knows. That's all I'm thinking, yeah. Are you able to uh, bill Medicaid mm -hmm. for any of this stuff? Yes, they, they, in the infant toddler, they do bill insurance. They do bill Medicaid. Uh, we do get that little bit of money, but they're such complex uh, children that it never covers. So th they always run a deficit. And obviously we're one agency, so we always cover that, but they just feel bad about not uh, carrying their own body. So the city's contribution for FY23 is $200,334. Anything else? Any additional questions or comments? Thank you for everything you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. And yeah, thank you so much. I will, I will happy to come back anytime, but you'll at least see me in a year if they haven't fired me. Oh, <laughs> we look forward to seeing you in a year. All right. All right, so that takes us on to item F, a consideration of revised Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center Memorandum of Understanding. Ms. Beauregard. So I'll walk you all through this item quickly. So the Memorandum of Understanding documents the relationship between the three jurisdictions that own the shelter and operate the shelter. That's Waynesboro, Stanton, and Augusta County. The agreement before you tonight is a revised agreement. It has not been updated since the shelter was created in 2011, but a lot of changes have happened. Obviously, I think in really the last year, most of these changes have happened. We've worked really hard to operate, to stabilize the shelter, and I've provided updates to you on that uh, fairly regularly. On July 1st, the responsibilities of the fiscal agent will transfer from the city of Waynesboro to Augusta County, so that's clearly stated in the MOU. It's also reflective of current practice and governance as well as we approach that date. Um, we've worked collaboratively, myself and the two other owners from Waynesboro and Augusta County, we've worked very collaboratively the last few months to work on these revisions and also to improve the operations of the shelter. And just for example, we had an owner's meeting today. Uh, you know that we have a new director starting in a few weeks, July 5th. So we're very, very excited about Olivia Vane starting. Uh, she actually just bought a house here, so it's great that she did that. So it's nice that she'll be part of the community immediately. We will have our next position will be an operations, man an operations manager, for lack of a better term, who's kind of a number two in command at the shelter. Uh, 
you all were also part of passing a budget for the shelter that's uh, more than previous years in terms of additional salaries, additional positions, additional operations. The areas we're still struggling are vet services. Uh, the county has now put out two, twice now, the request for proposals, no luck. So we're still searching and trying to find some solutions for vet, for supervising vet services and working through that. So we're, I believe we're going through some really good changes. We're getting some work done. We've received some good feedback, uh, even from the community members. Um, and they come to the meeting, so they're very, very interactive. I'll just quickly go through some of the major areas of the MOU. One is the cost sharing formula it does not change. It does take out the percentages that were in the old MOU. And basically it says it's based on the respective usage by each party. So how, what's the percentage of animals Stanton has at the shelter? Right now it's about 26%. That's the, and that applies for the operating budget, the capital budget and ownership of the facility. Secondly, I talked about the fiscal agent and Augusta County, Tim Fitzgerald County Administrator will also be the chair of our uh, owners starting July 1st. Well, he's kind of acting like it now, actually, to be honest with you, since they're transitioning over to Augusta County. And then that will be for two years. And then I think I'm next in line after that, two years after that or, or whoever. Um, and then as far as how we work, uh, and we none of us had history on this necessarily, we changed how we are able to approve issues that from unanimous to a majority. And that's typically how that works. So my camp was, well, we can blame my camp, I guess, because he was around in 2011, but we changed it to a majority vote rather than a unanimous vote. Those are the major changes. Otherwise it's little changes here and there, calling it an animal shelter rather than a pound, for instance. So just cleaning up the MOU, reflecting current practices and policies, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I feel like we've been made some good strides. When Ms. Vale comes on board in a few weeks, I believe that that will start getting even better. And especially when we hire an operations manager, hopefully this summer that will happen. And then some other positions as well. Oh, and there's more space at the shelter. I almost forgot about that. If those who have been to the shelter, it is slam packed. There's not a lot of space there for office space. The county was able to find a place to add a um, mobile office, I'll call it. It's a trailer. It's a mobile office, but it has electricity, power. It's going to be a very nice facility. Uh, not to say that we haven't looked at or thought about how the shelter could find a new space, and we have talked about that. But for now, um, their space in Lyndhurst, is, they're adapting to that. We hope the mobile office comes in before Ms. Vale starts. Uh, the county is already taken care of that. Should be delivered fairly soon, we think. So lots of good changes over there. And um, Waynesboro and Augusta County have approved this MOU. Waynesboro did last week in Augusta County last night. So happy to answer any questions. Colonel Leslie, you feel that without ever changing everything, that it is fiscally stable right oh, now? Oh, I do, yes. Okay. They, and there is a fund balance that Waynesboro will be transferring over to Augusta County. And so there's, it's about 400,000 or so. So that's, so that's good. So over the years, since 2011, that's what's built up. And that can be used for whatever is determined to be used for. And part of that will be when the new director comes on, what does she feel that's needed? What is, you know, maybe there's something that's not in the budget that's one time. So there's, it's healthy. It's very healthy. And the, the shelter still plans on keeping the no kill or the save rate that so they've they have. Always... A, they ha it's not quite no kill. They do have a high save rate. They're very proud of. I want to say it's around ninety five percent. In mm -hmm. fact, the report we saw today, which is on our website, if you're interested, the average for the year so far, I believe, is ninety six percent. Okay, right. Good. So they're very, very interested in keeping that as a at a high. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Any additional questions or comments, Councillor Holmes? How many days do they need a vet there? Just once a week or is it? Uh, I believe it is, I'd have to look at the RFP. I believe it is weekly that they come in and they do vaccinations, medications. The problem, without a, the problem is without a supervising vet, you can't have medications at the facility. So they're having to take the animals to a vet clinic right. to actually have services done. So, and, they, and they still probably farm out spading and things like that. Yes. So they're, they we're working around all that. It would be nice to have a supervising vet though that could come in and supervise 
or at least authorize the use of the, the various medications that only they can promote and authorize. So, um, but right now we're looking at other vet, taking them to other vet clinics. Um, it's, it's quite a conundrum right now. We're, we're working through it, so. Um, and where do things stand as far as the formation of an advisory committee? So we were waiting for Ms. Vale to come on board and, and I'm very excited about her experience because she is coming from the Bronx, Parks and Recreation, and a lot of her work there was community oriented and pulling different stakeholders together on very difficult projects, um, very people, you know, projects that people weren't agreeing about, and she would bring those folks together to get them to agree on a specific project or, or you know, initiative for the Parks and Rec Department in the Bronx. So she's had a lot of community relationship experience. So that will be a task for her to work on when we, when she's on board, we will of course work with her on that very closely as well. We're very interested in having that established. It's just a matter of getting her on board, having a little bit of time pass, getting an operations manager on board. And then she's definitely interested in that. We talked about it in her interview with her. And so she's done that type of work before, so. Okay, great. Well, I would certainly like to go on record to say thank you to Augusta County for their willingness to take the lead concerning the animal shelter. They've done a great job, yeah. Right, Mayor, with that, Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to approve the revised Shenandoah Valley Animal Services Center Memorandum of Understanding. And right, Mayor, <clears throat> I'll second that. Right, we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Robertson and a second by Councillor Claffey. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Ms. Dull? Aye. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. The motion carries. All right, thank you. That takes us on to item G, a discussion and consideration of the renaming of the Equity and Diversity Commission. Ms. Beauregard. So this was added to your agenda this evening because this just happened last evening at the Equity and Diversity Commission's first kind of operational meeting. The, there was a motion made and the commission approved to rename the commission the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Commission or DEI. They had a very good discussion about it. Mayor Oaks, you heard that discussion, as did Ms. Mead, who I believe had to leave the meeting. So if, if I say something and you need to, would like to add something, feel free. DEI is a very common term. People understand what that means. They also felt that inclusion, adding the word inclusion would further define their goals. So it was a very good discussion. Um, so they're asking council's approval this evening to rename the commission to the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Commission. Uh, they were very excited about that change. So I'll be happy to answer any questions, anybody. Madam yeah. Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I just make a motion to approve the name change to Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Commission. If that's what they want to call, absolutely. And there's a motion on the floor. Is there Thank a second? Right. Councillor Holmes is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dull? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. The motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to matters from the interim city manager, Ms. Beauregard. Take my paper back out. I just have two items this evening. One is from tourism that the city of Stanton has been named as one of 32 charming mountain towns to visit this fall in Southern Virginia, right. Southern Living. But I mean, we're charming all time of year, frankly. <laughs> but anyway, to focus on the fall. And then the second item I'd like to mention is on June 16th, uh, during a meeting of the Virginia State Review Board and the Virginia Board of Historic Resources, the Stanton Steam Laundry property was approved for inclusion in the Virginia Landmarks Register and recommended to the National Register of Historic Places. The Stanton Historic Preservation Commission supported the nomination, noting that, quote, inclusion on the registers is an important recognition of the historic complex of the historic complex and enables use of historic tax credits. Utilizing the historic tax credit process ensures quality rehabilitation, rehabilitation of the property following the Secretary of Interior standards and guidelines, unquote. 
Stanton City Council approved the rezoning of the Stanton Steam Laundry in September of 2021 to a new mixed use zoning district to enable redevelopment of the property. So that's, that's exciting news for that property and for the redevelopment of that. And that's all I have for this evening. Great, good news, thank you. All right, that takes us to matters from the public. This part of City Council's agenda is entitled Matters from the Public. It is a time that Council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. A copy of the Stanton City Council's Matter from the Public rules are available in paper form at the clerk's desk and online on the City of Stanton's webpage. You are asked to familiarize yourself with those rules before commenting. Please come to the podium or begin your call, identify yourself, and complete your remarks within five minutes. Uh, just like with the public hearing, I'll start with the, uh, the citizens uh, in the audience first, and then we'll go to the Zoom. If you can come to the podium, state your name, your address, um, and then you have five minutes. With that, Matters from the Public is now open. Welcome. Well, I have my hearing aids on. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, you know, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. <laughs> However, this was a very interesting meeting. There was a great song and dance program put on by the Stanton Crossing Plan. I really thought sometimes, what's going on? I don't know. Some things that don't make very much sense to me. Like for example, the big picture, the taxes per acre, $12,000, $233. I can't understand. I hope that you all understand that in 1950, the population of the country was 150 million. It's now over 300 million, 300 million in another, 20 years or so, it will be 500 million. China is the most productive manufacturing country in the world. The United States has lost it because a lot of the industry went overseas. It has to come back. When Before you decide to get rid of Stanton Crossing by selling some of the properties, think twice. Think twice because things are changing. Things are changing very dry, quickly. And you have to start thinking about not today, but about 20 years from today. Stanton is probably one of the nicest cities that a person could live in. No question about it. There may be some questions about some of the council members, but that's oh. irrelevant. That's irrelevant. That doesn't count <laughs> because they come and they go like the weather, it comes and it goes. And so will happen with the council, it comes and it goes. But those who are in council now have to think twice before they give up their property. There's a lot of property just outside of the mall. Is the mall in Stanton no, or is uh, in Augusta County? Augusta County. That shouldn't be. It should be part of Stanton. There's a lot of property in and around that mall that belongs to Stanton, not to Augusta County. With respect to the courthouse, they want the courthouse? Fine, give us the property that's around the mall and Stanton. Do something positive and constructive for Stanton. Make it bigger and make it more pleasant, okay? Make it a home for artists for music, for art and so forth. You have everything here to do that, but it's up to you to do that. Negotiate with Augusta County. That Stanton Mall and that whole area above Stanton Mall there should belongs to Augusta, to uh, the city of Stanton, not Augusta County. They shouldn't be benefiting by it, okay? And another thing, I had a long discussion with Mr. the head of the real estate department. And I am shocked to find out that location, 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 which are the should be the prime positions for determine and assessment is not even considered. That fellow was left 
Charlottesville and Albemarle County, and he comes to Stanton and he gets more, a bigger salary from Stanton than he got from Charlottesville or Albemarle County. County. How is that possible? I don't know. Somebody, there must have been some shenanigans going on with Mr. Rosenberg and that individual to give him a salary that's way out of line. Well, I'm not going to take the last 40 minutes. There's a whole bunch of other stuff I have to say, but I, I just don't have the time nor the energy. And people have said to me, you've wasted almost a year going before this council expressing your views. They don't listen. Well, you all have a good day. And I and let me conclude it by saying I have no animosity with respect to any of you. You're in a position as council, you have a job to do. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kessiker, do we have anyone with their hands raised? No, ma'am. All right, would anyone else from the audience care to address the council? Welcome. Thank you. It's Dr. Mary Miller from 471 Albemarle Avenue. Um, so I don't usually talk to you about um, things that are going on. I, seem to think about other things. Um, and uh, Mr. Fossa has uh, impressed me with um, his talk about integrity. So um, we'll talk about integrity. Um, it's more than honesty. Integrity resists stress from within ourselves and from others. It includes incorruptibility. That means that someone who ca uh, cannot be caused to be dishonest. Um, being ethical defines right and wrong conduct, guides us to make the world a better place. Um, it's more than simply following the law. We all know slavery was wrong. It de dehumanized millions of people, and even though it was touted as God's will by many Southern churches. But ethical is a moral commitment based on standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do in terms of justice and benefits to the community and the world. Integrity includes being candid, at, that is a sincere expression of the absence of deception. Probity, adherence to what is right, even when it conflicts with personal preferences. Truth, finding the truth and not relying on pundits, propaganda or social media for opinions or to reinforce established beliefs. Reliability, keeping your word, being dependable. Rectitude, being reliable in judgment, not disregarding science or data to rationalize your personal beliefs. Recognizing delusions and conspiracies, being responsible and trustworthy. And part of that came from the New England Journal of Medicine and how science um, is used and twisted for people's uh, personal uh, agendas. Uh, respect, um, giving consideration and esteem to every person and valuing the dignity and worthiness of every person. And then um, I wonder, I looked up the, we talked about uh, democracy, I looked up that up, and uh, it's a government by the people, especially the rule of the majority, a government in which the, the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them, the absence of heredity or arbitrary privileges, which differs from cronyism, which is uh, defined as a practice of favoring one's friends or supporters especially in political decisions. Uh, cronyism is not illegal, but it is unethical. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kessiker, does anyone have their hands raised? No, ma'am. All right. Would anyone else from the audience care to address the council? Welcome. Oh, Mary. Stop the clock if you can. He hasn't 
can you give it? Oh, I, well, that's all right. I won't take five minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Brad Arrowwood. Uh, I live at 236 Fillmore in Stanton. Um, I uh, am a Chief Operations Officer for Habitat for Humanity. I just wanted to, um, well, we're about to add solar to the roof of our restore. Um, and uh, we, we'd like to kind of lead with that, and we'd, we'd like to move towards being more carbon neutral uh, with our idea of re reusing uh, things in our store as well, too. And it, it just had us thinking about how Stanton has a whole lot of flat roof space uh, downtown that's just heating up in the sun. Um, and it would be I think a good thing for this council to consider the idea of allowing solar on the rooftops of houses within the historic district uh, as it moves forward and the technology becomes more efficient and better along the way. I don't think it's an eyesore. I think it would be an admirable goal for our city to move towards uh, having less of a carbon footprint uh, along the way. And it would be one more marketing feather in our cap as well, uh, too, as a destination. So just something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kessiker, any hands raised? No, ma'am. All right. Uh, anyone else from the audience? Last chance? Okay. Um, with that, I will now entertain a motion to go into closed session. Uh, is it there? It it would be the work session motion. Oh, work session. Well, if I Give find something, all right, um, Adam Mayor. Uh, hold on here. We're still identifying this one. This is Carol and all. I move to enter a closed meeting pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1 to discuss and evaluate the performance of the City of Stanton's interim city manager. All right. Thank you, Councillor Dahl. Uh, that's a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right. That Vice 12 Mayor. years experience came in good. Vice Mayor um, Mark Robertson is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dole? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. We're now in closed session. I'll entertain a motion to come out of closed session. Carolyn Dole, I move the council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second that. This is Terry Holmes. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Kessiker, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey? Aye. Ms. Dole? Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson? Aye. Mr. Holmes? Aye. Mayor Oaks? Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. Good job, everyone. That brings us into an open session as the Mayor of the City of Stanton. I call the June 23rd, 2022 regular Stanton City Council meeting adjourned.